Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. Yeah, I hear I'm chatting to the noise. Move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear I'm chatting with the noise. Just too sharp with the prize. White girls let it tell me I'm awesome. Yeah, act like fire on the pond. If you wanna touch my please use caution. Call like zero degree. I'm out the cage, gotta let out the beast. Revolutionary guy, let out the streets. Locked in a cage, I'ma let out the, let out the, let out the, let out the, let out the sheets. We came to the world, man, forget my peace. We take the west side, take on the east. I'ma put them in the cage, never let out the, let out the, let out the, let out the. I hear him chat to the noise, move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear him chat with the boys, not so tough, but lines keep walking, yeah. Just too sharp with the boys, white girls, better tell me I'm awesome, yeah. Hot like fire on the pine, if you wanna touch my feet. Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. If you've been listening to our show for a while, you know uh, that we were friends. The show was friends with Chris Mortensen, and we will honor him a little bit later on in the show. Uh, so we don't get bogged down uh, right now in some feelings that are even worse than the ones from this weekend. But we lost Chris Mortensen, a friend of the show, friend of ours at the age of 72. He'd been fighting throat cancer for a long time, a fundamentally decent human being at a time that we can use a lot more of those because there does seem to be a general lack of decency everywhere. And when you see and hear all of the tributes to him, they all echo the same thing about just his general decency and kindness. So we will be doing that a little bit later in the show. The big story over the weekend, Stugat, uh, big sports story, is uh, Caitlin Clark uh, setting the all-time record in the NCAA for scoring. Put this on the poll, Juju, at Lebitard Show. Did you know that Pistol Pete was the record holder for all-time NCAA points before Caitlin Clark? Because I did not. Had no idea. Uh, he did it in three years. He did it without a three-point line. In my personal record book, he is still the record holder. How oh about that? Oh, my God. What uh, happened well, there? We, we've, got got s- we've got someone writing in, no three-point line or shot clock when the pistol played, and he used a larger basketball. But, yeah, congratulations. He's that guy. <laughs> I'm sitting next to that That's guy. A good point. I'm I mean. somehow sitting next to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's how. That's your big takeaway from yesterday. Uh, I thought it interesting, Stugat, though not surprising, that the Indiana Fever, their ticket prices have doubled because uh, they've got the first pick in the draft. They doubled <laughs> as soon as Caitlin Clark said she was going pro. Uh, did Caitlin Clark say that she was going pro at least in part because Indiana has the first pick? Did that have anything to do at all with her decision, according to her? Because... Um, being able to stay in that market and be a phenomenon that that just I, I'm honestly Stugatz, I'm more and more surprised at how it how quickly this has happened after it took forever to happen where the women's game becomes this kind of phenomenon where it gets bigger ratings than the NBA games we've been talking about in the yep. regular season and that she is far and away I don't even know. Who's second place for the biggest sports story in college basketball, men's or women's? Like, how? what's the distance between Caitlin Clark as a phenomenon that forces Nike to go to Iowa, that has uh, a, a general effervescence and an enthusiasm around weekend uh, women's basketball that you have never seen before because of the star power or any kind of basketball because of the star power that she has and because male college basketball does no longer has the three and four year star who creates a story and creates an attachment and and men's college basketball doesn't have any of these attachments it's just got regional attachments when you say same market do you mean just relatively close to each other because they're about seven hours away from each other mm-hmm. Iowa and Indiana yep. okay it's a drive Dan <laughs> My, my, Different states. My, yeah. Both start with an my I. Bad. Yes, right. my bad. I before you except after C, some say. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. we understand. But there's another I state in between. Yes. So. Midwest, really? Illinois somewhere. Both right. Midwest. <laughs> that causes, uh, yes, that's my bad there. I thought for some for some reason I was confusing. I went Indiana. Not a great start by me. Same place. Uh, no. It, it's not. This it's, is why I must stand up for Wisconsin and the Midwest. Really? When you guys sh- 
all over the Midwest. What do you it's mean? not you guys. Just Don't Kenosha. put do, do not put me in there. I do not do that. I do not do that. I know that we have listeners. You just think all they're all over. one state. That's yeah. true. I do do that. And they are kind of. That I do do. <laughs> that is all uh that is all fair. Um can I uh play some sound here? I want to ask you a couple of things here, Stu as I noticed that uh the the relationship between athletes and the media continues to get more and more contentious. I want to show you. Uh, yes, please put up a map there so that I could see the Ancient difference. Map. Oldest map we could find. It's a railroad map. <laughs> Jesus. Huh. I, I want to show you a couple of things that happened this weekend. Uh, one was Caleb Williams shows up at the Combine, Stugatz, and everyone says, even though there was some testing he was unwilling to do, everyone says that um, – he uh, was very nice to everybody, that he stayed longer than everybody, that he said uh, goodbye and thanked all of the, the workers who put the combine together. But here is his initial interaction as he clears his throat and sits down to take questions from the media at the combine. Here's the initial interaction. Good morning, everybody. Are you afraid to compete? How do you respond to people saying that you're worried to be compared side by side with your peers and medicals, uh, measurements, uh, and workouts? Are you afraid to be measured against this guy one-on-one? -on -one? Is that why you're not doing things? No, um, not doing things. Uh, it was a decision by me and my team, my family. Um, and it comes down to that. An aggressive start there. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Are you afraid to compete? <laughs> Getting right to it, man. No softballs. <laughs> he, he cleared his throat and said good morning. And the first question is, Caleb, are you afraid to compete? And how do you respond to people saying that you're worried to be compared side by side to your peers in medicals, measurements, and workouts? Are you afraid to be measured against those guys one on one? Is that why you're not doing things? The juxtaposition. I want to replay. I'm going to fade it out after two seconds. Just the how's everybody doing? To are you afraid to compete? It's just such a funny three seconds. Good morning, everybody. Are you afraid to compete? <laughs> I love him cocking his head to like <laughs> lean closer. Like, eh, are you, like what does what, he say? Is that, did he say what I thought he said? He does. He gets closer. He tries to lean in closer to hear more of the question. Uh, and then there is Draymond Green, Stugatz, who doesn't really, he's not quite as polite as Caleb Williams is in this circumstances. Uh, uh, you've got after a game, they've Golden State has gone into New York and beaten the Knicks. Last yep. night, by the way. Golden State loses by 50 to Boston, and Cleveland still has no answers for the Knicks. The Knicks will beat Cleveland uh, no matter who's injured, no matter where they're playing. I think they lost by 52, trailed by 42 at half or something like that. It's ridiculous. Extension, please, Steve Kerr. The most exciting part of that Celtics-Warriors game was when the uh, local news coverage broke in to say there was a hailstorm in Broward County last night. Good second half. If they were trailing by 42 at the first half, they only lost by 52? Yeah. Yeah. I thought they went down by 50 in the first half. Maybe it was just 42. Regardless, it was it was a bit jarring to see. And what's funniest about that to me is, to God's Boston, is far and away better than anyone in the league. They've got like three 50-point wins. I, their point differential is over 10. They're winning by an average of double digits a game. And they're still terrified of Miami. <laughs> like, they're appreciably better than they were last year. Trading Marcus Smart was a good decision. Porzingis and Holiday have been very good for them. They are appreciably better than they were last year. And Boston Celtics fans still are terrified of the Miami Heat. This, <laughs> this feels like Boston's year. I know I'm not saying anything crazy. They seem like just above everybody else. Not I'm not even talking in the East. Like th if they don't win this year, they're the year, best team in the NBA. That coach is fired if they don't win the entire championship wow. this year. Really? Dude, they're that good. Oh, calling for Missoula's head after this is I crazy. mean, Stan Van Gundy said as much. Everybody's saying as much. It's uh, it's obvious they're a good deal better than everybody and people don't trust that they won't lose a game 7 at home because they've seen it happen. You're so right though. Everything they've built up this season, if they play the Heat in the playoffs and the Heat take game 1, it's all gone. It all goes away. Oh, I love it. Well, but what do you mean it goes away? Celtics fans are already scared of the Heat. They 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 have been saying for years this Celtics team isn't like the previous Celtics teams, and those t previous Celtics teams continue to lose. 
it does feel like this year is a bit different for the Celtics. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing with this because last year they had basically – well, they didn't have the same well, what, team. What, they added no, Porzingis. No, no, wait a minute. What you're doing is they look better than they've ever looked. I like, know, but I'm not going to be shocked if the Bucks beat them in the playoffs. I'm not going to be shocked if the Nuggets beat them in the NBA Finals. I'm not going to be shocked if the Heat beat them in the first round. I mean – I know, but you never admit to being shocked because you're like Tony. You know everything before <laughs> it happens. Like, you, you never That's admit I mean. to being shocked by anything. It's fair. Yeah. Can I tell you something I was shocked by? Why are you here? You told everybody that you were on vacation this week. I didn't week. tell anyone I was on vacation. I have an email from you saying you were on vacation this week. Everybody planned for you to not be here. You said you were going to do this show two hours per day from Wrigley Field. Wow. <laughs> no, 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 no. What I sent to Carl was, this is what I would like to do to prevent myself from traveling the way I've been traveling because it's not healthy. My body hurts, too many airplanes. So I said, this is what I would like to do to prevent traveling so much. I'd like on this week, this week I told them, I would like to to, uh, to do two hours from Wrigley Field from the DraftKings Sportsbook. Dan does three hours with you guys from here. That's what I wanted to do so I didn't have to travel back, okay? I mean, but we're never going to get there. So Is that an option? Can I do that? No. I mean, I can't do it, so... We did all think you were going to be on vacation this. You I never mean, followed up and said, "Never mind, I'm going to be in." I mean, I'll gladly start one if you guys would like. I mean, I feel very warm and friendly here. I just uh, I, Billy's just saying we were surprised. Everyone to, was confused as soon as we say her, like, "What's happening now?" Uh, so here is Draymond Green after they beat the New York Knicks, talking to one of the announcers. There are three announcers here on the stage. One of them is Bonta Hill. Welcome to Toyota Warriors Post Game Live. Bully Fezzi, Bonte here. And first of all, let's start about, let's talk about MSG. Bonte, what is it like? I'm shocked you're talking to me. The way you was talking about me when I got suspended, I am very shocked you're talking to me. Really? Go ahead. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, go ahead, though. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, hey, t- tell me about Planet MSG. You guys go there once a year. There's a lot of Warrior fans out there. Uh, describe the energy out there at MSG. It's always a fun game. Day, day. What's going on, man? <laughs> <laughs> he had him rattled. <laughs> he had him rattled. <laughs> you understand, though, Stugatz, right? When I put them side by side, Caleb Williams and uh, Draymond Green, you understand why it continues to rise, the feelings uh, that are poisonous between athletes and the media, right? Of course, yes. I mean, Caleb Williams is, you know, politely saying hello, good morning, and he's getting that right in his face a second later, yes. He can go on his own podcast, his own platforms, create his own platforms, and say whatever the hell he wants to say. The Caleb one is funny because that just feels like an eager journalist trying to get it. He's like, if I don't get in now, I'm not going to get a question in, but it's just such a funny way to start a press conference. <laughs> um, it is brutal when a guy is trying to be nice about things, but I'm, I'm curious whether you guys think either of the things matter that I'm about to tell you that Caleb Williams declined to do some of the testing or on the other end that he stayed till the end of everything and thanked all the volunteers for helping putting on the scouting combine do either of those things matter in any kind of way (laughs) really I mean not competing matters to me more we're not drafting on politeness. When you're the when you're supposed to be the, the first pick, why would you take any of these tests? You can only go down. Didn't didn't the Washington Pro Day produce the fastest forty times that we saw? Like the Washington Pro Day, wasn't that the place that like why do you have to go compete with these other guys just because the NFL wants you to compete with these other guys when you're going to be the number one pick, whether you do any of that stuff or not? Like, That's why we have pro days, Dan. Like I'll throw on my time, not on your time. I don't want to go. Maybe I don't like the the house that Peyton built, and I can throw on my own turf. Well, wait, hold on a second. Imagine if you're a di- or you're it's interviewing a for a job, and the and the interview. Viewer is like, hey, can you come meet me? And you're like, no, no on come, Zoom. come to my house when I feel like it. No, thank That's you. That's exactly what quarterbacks do. I mean, if you're going to be the number one pick, whether you interview or not, normally when I go interview for a job, I'm uh, I'm trying to impress that person because I have fewer options than Caleb Williams has. What was your last When's job? When's the interview? last time you've yeah. interviewed? We for all were a job? thinking it. I mean, seriously. What year? Never. Oh, I mean, I just gave yeah. you the job. It would have probably yeah. been internship 
probably oh. would have been when I was an intern at the Miami Herald. Knock it off, Jessica. <laughs> uh, late 1980s would have been the last time uh. I interviewed for a job. Well, the, the thing about the combine now is that players, ha some players have more leverage and they don't have to do all of these drills because at some point it will end up hurting you more than helping you. All of his tape is out there. He won the Heisman last year. Yeah, he's going to be the first pick overall. I guess it, maybe there's a question of if the Bears take him or if someone trades for him, but – why would he? Why would he need to do any of this? It's very silly. It looks like you're hiding something, though. No, doesn't no, it? It doesn't. Wow. It doesn't. I don't think then so. Then go compete. If you're, you're that great, if you're that talented, show everyone how talented you are. You've seen my are. tape. I've done it in game. I don't need to put on tights and go run for you. <laughs> there is somebody on Twitter, a former NFL scout, who says the following: Stugatz, Caleb Williams poses the greatest threat to the NFL's infrastructure that I've ever seen in a prospect with all the documented examples of him putting himself above the team and process. Carl Williams, Caleb's dad, is desperately trying to manipulate the process and get his son to drop in the draft because of his documented disdain for the process, as written about in The Athletic. Quote, Carl has questioned the NFL rookie wage scale, the draft declaration deadline, eligibility rules, medical testing, and the way players are paid. In a September interview with GQ, he expressed disdain for the entire draft process where the worst possible team, the worst organization in the league because of their desire for parity, gets the first pick. I saw that uh, Dominique Foxworth said, among other things, that the draft is un-American. Uh, it is in terms of freedom or what we think of America, but in terms of exploiting, uh, exploiting human beings. America loves it. Oh, that's very American. Quintessentially... <laughs> Uh, American this one but you do understand why it is that Caleb Williams and his dad would create some fear because this former scout was saying that he uh, either way I have a fourth round grade on him after studying every single snap he's taken the past uh, two seasons and he's an elite athlete who's underdeveloped as a quarterback all of the NFL insiders Adam Schefter will be on with us later all of the NFL insiders say that Caleb Williams is going number one to the Bears. There's no one who's saying anything else, correct? I think the leverage also comes from, if you're Caleb Williams, like how stupid will a team feel for not drafting you? And the Bears have been in this position before where they traded up to get Mitch Trubisky while Patrick Mahomes was available. And this is a, a, an organization, different front office now, of course, but this is an organization that has been ridiculed for years for passing on a generational talent when they had the ability to pick them. Although, obviously, Patrick Mahomes was a way more um, like disputed pick in that draft. Like the, Caleb Williams, like you said, is almost universally – the number one overall quarterback in this draft. Caleb's dad makes a lot of great points when it comes to the draft and just how things work in the process of the NFL and rookies. What if Caleb Williams goes in and just makes a mockery of the combine, runs a slow 40, throws bad, does everything terrible, flunks the combine. To slide. Just like to throws slide. the football in the wrong direction. Right, and he's like, hey, here you go. This is what I'm doing. To get to the nine. Draft me or no. Just keeps fumbling snaps. Just like toy with the system. What can I do here and still get drafted first up. overall? I'd like to go to that photograph, if we could, that still Stugatz, because I, I, I was floored. Like, we, we know that sport is incredibly hard and, and physical, right? We know that uh, – you, did you read this, the reports this weekend that Darren Waller was thinking at the end of last season that he wanted to retire at the end of last season and is still contemplating retirement? The Giants will do that to you. How it felt to play for the Giants uh, when they're, they're sitting there playing with Tommy DeVito and Darren Waller's like, you know what, I don't think I want to do this anymore <laughs> because of the way that his body hurts. But the, the, the way these guys are moving at the combine and the size of these human beings, Stugatz, continues to be something that is breathtaking. It's, uh, look at this photograph right here. Like, I, I mean, look, those are normal-sized human beings in a press conference setting asking Caleb Williams all <laughs> sorts of ridiculous, challenging questions that he doesn't deserve. Is that Hal sit. Habib taking the picture in front of him? I know it's a of random the, name. Of the Palm Beach Post? Now, he is tiny. The guy in front with the white shirt, he's like three feet shorter than him. Hal Habib is not, Hal Habib <laughs> is not a normal-sized human being. The fact that Dan knew who you were talking about is a major upset. I mean... Everyone knows Hal Habib. Like, really? Uh, Nobody knows him. 
That is the guy who uh, verifies that Greg Cody came very close to once making a 50-yard field Confirmed goal. Confirmed that that is Hal Habit, by the way. <laughs> I okay. know that head. Okay, he is a tiny human being then. He is. <laughs> yeah. These are not all normal-sized human beings. He's below beings. this guy's nipples. <laughs> Undersized human beings. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a bit nuts, is it not? Like what it is that you're trying to measure at these combines when you're talking about these wingspans, wingspans this size, this speed. Uh, that that by the way is uh, Georgia tackle. It's an offensive tackle, Amarius. Uh, is it Mims? And and he's gonna go high because how does anyone get past that? He's 340 pounds and there's no fat on him. Solid muscle. Because <laughs> he's going against guys that are that size, not the size of how nobody's habit, that size, yeah, whatever his name is. <laughs> <laughs> Tony was claiming earlier that he uh, that there's a new MMA fighter who uh, oh. is destroying people, who a Cuban MMA fighter who has five fights that Tony is claiming have been decided in a total of 15 seconds. That's, that's He's incredible. Crazy. His name is Robelis de España. He's a former Cuban Taekwondo medalist in the Olympics. And when you look at this guy, you're like, how is this? He's he's three times bigger than the cage behind him. So he's standing, and the cage behind him, like, is at his nipples, and he's throwing head kicks. He's throwing hammer fist and punches, and he's knocking everybody out in like four or five seconds. It's the most incredible thing. He's fighting here at UFC 299 on Saturday. He's in the prelims. This is his first UFC fight. Oh. Look how big this guy is. Massive. <laughs> he's incredible. He's like the new the new athlete for the MMA is because you're that big and you can move that way. Is is like these offensive linemen that are now running four nines that are three hundred fifty pounds. Does, it doesn't tell you everything, right? I remember Frank Bruno. He came into the ring against Mike Tyson, was much larger than him, physically impressive, and lost rather quickly. Uh, uh, Bob Sapp, same sort of thing, uh, was a giant person but couldn't actually fight. But lest you think, I want to show the audience this, Dugats. Lest you think this kind of power and this kind of uh, fighting does not hurt. I just want to I want to show you a random fan who challenged here Jorge Masvidal thinking this sounds like something Stugatz would do. Uh, thinking that he could handle a leg kick from Jorge Masvidal <laughs> in a hotel ballroom of some sort. Uh, let's play this video real quick. Let's see if the sound, if the uh, audio audience can hear the sound of when it is that the leg makes contact. Uh. Uh, make it really suffer. Bro takes one power, say 1,000. What? Oh! 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 Brutal. Yeah, so uh, for the audio audience, the man went down very quickly and then just started sliding across the rug in a great deal of pain. Threw a middle a finger bird too. Yep. Yeah. Ah, bird. I love a bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is fun for you. Nothing sticks out like a ballroom. You called it before. Like, There's just something about a, a hotel ballroom. You, you always know when you're in it. Like, you know, there's no, there's no like way to hide a ballroom. If I'm taking a video and you're in a ballroom, I know right away that you're in a hotel ballroom. What's the amount of money I would have to pay any of you to endure that kick? Any of you? Hmm. I would do it for a million. Mm. Oh, a lot of money. A like, thousand? You would do it for less, Chris. Uh, I'm not doing it for 100K. What? What? Dude, that is... He's gonna break my leg. No, he's not gonna break your leg. So you have a broken like leg in a cast. You have a hundred k. I mean, you'll recover. All right, go ahead. Do it for ten k, Tony. Go Medical ahead. bills. I, I didn't ever said. Stugatz just said a thousand, which made I was me, asking, which made I mean, me want to pay it. Like I'll, I'll like <laughs> in cash right now. I think. I, I, I'll pay a thousand dollars to have Stugatz do that in the back of the room with Jorge Masvidal. <laughs> you'll George, pay me a thousand. Yes. Okay. A yes. thousand from Masvidal. A thousand from you. Not uh, no. Just no. Thousand, nothing. No wonder. What are you? I was asking. This. I was just throwing a number out there. I didn't say I would do it for a thousand dollars. I mean, you you did say a thousand. We all heard you. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question. I hate mark when I do that to myself, now. Roy. I really do. <laughs> I mean, he seizes on the opportunity. I mean, Next I mean, thing I mean, you know, I have a broken leg for a thousand bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't even cover the medical bills for you. <laughs> I don't even know why. I don't even know why you would go that low. Um. It seems awful. Uh, can we, Sullivan, there are a couple of people I'd like you to reach. I'd like you to reach 
that person who's crawling across the ballroom floor so that I can ask them what the actual damage was. And I'd also like you to reach uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Indiana State player that we were all introduced <laughs> to this guy. weekend. It's the greatest nickname I've ever heard, <laughs> calling that kid Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> Find me both of these people, please. I'd like to talk to both of them. $1,000. Stugatz is going to writhe across a ballroom floor. Yeah. Tell me, is it that time for him yet? When the basketball is now mattering. Time of year with Jimmy Butler will now be feeling the past leading to easy layups. Everyone thinks that the Celtics will finally go in it all. Thinks that the Celtics will finally go in it all. Boston fans, hear his name. Media celebrating an easy path for the wrong team. They're going down, down in an early round. Celtics are going down swinging. They'll be the number one seed in the East. Loaded team losing to playoff Jimmy. They're going down, down in an early round. Celtics are going down swinging. They'll be the number one seed in the East. Loaded team losing to playoff Jimmy. Jimmy Butler had a season high, 37 points against Utah. Also, this from Anthony Chang Stugatz. 260 players in the league have played at least 20 games and shot at least two threes a game. Jimmy Butler has the third best shooting percentage from three, which seems crazy. Surprising, yeah. Uh, LeBron James has the best three-point shooting percentage of his career this year which makes absolutely no sense at all as the oldest player in the league. He Wade reached, did that late in his career. He reaches, Not like this, Well, though. no, but Wade, I mean, Wade, Wade was a historically bad three-point shooter and became slightly better. LeBron's a great three-point shooter this year. Not okay. He's a great three-point shooter, and it's the highest percentage of his career. He scores 40,000 the other day. You cannot talk enough about this person's career, Stugatz, because the consistency is such. I saw some of the stats. He got to the first 10,000 points in the same number of games as he got the last 10,000 points. So the aging hasn't been appreciable offensively. There hasn't been aging. It seems like, right? Well, on defense, there has been, and it's obvious, and he and he's more lumbering. He's still as strong, but his his scoring remains something that is a marvel. And beyond that, I wanted to talk about what he said after scoring 40,000 points because he said people were rooting for him to fail, and I think this is just conjured doubt by him i i imagine guys like him to be surrounded by yes men so is he just doing what we're doing where if there are a hundred comments you notice the two negative ones because uh his commentary on this is simply off it's factually misremembering what it is that was swirling around him people were not rooting again in mass rooting against uh, LeBron James hoping that he would be a bust or thinking he would be a bust. Well, once he went to Miami, the entire city of Cleveland did. Well, the world, the, the, and then the entire world. But that, right. that's not – he's talking no, about – he well, He's talking about the beginning of his career. Right. He, he was saying things. We'll get that sound in a second. But it, it was at least a bit surprising to me to hear him misremember it this way, creating a me-against-the-world scenario when I believe all of us – we're wildly anticipating whatever it is that he would do. We placed unreasonable expectations on them, and I no, think— No, he did that himself, Dan. He anointed himself King James before Stugatz. he stepped— Stugatz. Dan, before he stepped foot on an NBA Stugatz. floor. He Stugatz. did. He did it by himself in Akron, Ohio. He didn't have any help. He did he it himself. He owned Sports Illustrated, put himself on the covers. He, he did it himself. <laughs> he, he, uh, he, The idea— that this human being has had those expectations, and I can say after 20 years he's exceeded 
every expectation is staggering. That the expectations, because uh, the only expectation he will not have exceeded is championships, correct? I mean, he was supposed to be the best ever, and he's not. So he didn't technically exceed expectations there. I'm sure he set out to be the best ever, and he's not the best ever. I'm sure that disappoints him. It he does. Fell short. Right. Yeah, it seems. Too short. Numerically, he's kind of the best ever, Stu. He's not. If you look at the numbers. Right. I do look at numbers. Six rings to four. Every LeBron conversation that's ever been had has been weird. People really? Can't, Every- people just can't be normal about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's my take. I would think, though, that the people who love Michael Jordan the way I love Michael Jordan, I can see how LeBron thinks that. You're rooting for me not to be the all-time best you know, player in NBA history because you love Michael so much. I didn't want LeBron to get to six. I didn't want to have to admit that he's better than Michael Jordan, and I never will. How about that? How about that? But it's, it's, it's four in the IST, right? Yeah, it's five, exactly right. Yeah, well. It's one away. He's got a bunch of losses in the finals as well. How do you arrive in a place, if you're LeBron James, that you think everyone is against you? In what world? How is that, how is that, how is that a real thing? When you dominate your sport for 20-some-odd years and there's really nobody equal to you in stature as far as, like, the way that you play the game, you have to conjure up some sort of hater, yeah. right? You have to drop a straw man to always push yourself. Kobe motivate, did the same thing. Right. Like, all the greats do the same thing. Michael would say, oh, this guy tied his shoes weird. I'm going to go after him. Like, that's just the way that it is. Yeah. Uh, Tony, I'm laughing when you talk just because you, you came in here same. Uh, today <laughs> ag- ag- aggressively. You came in today, and, and people were cautioning you. Uh, let's play this sound here. Uh, Over the course of the weekend, Barry Jackson of the Miami Herald retook his position, and it's a great position. It's a great lane for him. He infuriates people every year. When the Heat does its kids broadcast and Barry Jackson comes out and says it's annoying. Literally the Heat's kids broadcast because that's the only people that do the games. They They work hard. Wait, what do you mean? They're all like Nepo baby kids? Yes, they're all employees kids. I didn't say that. Is that true? Uh, most of them are, yes. I don't know if every single one of them is, but most of them are the kids. Tony says 80%. I feel safe, <laughs> right? 80%? It's probably low. It feels like a made-up number. It's yeah. a, a lot of them are the kids of Heat's empl- Heat employees. They do a family day on Sunday, and, and Barry Jackson is the only person in the media who has been loudly – uh, against the kids and the kids' broadcast. It's Let's go odd. down to Sarah Crotty. <laughs> it's an odd lane for Barry. I'm kidding. I don't know her name. <laughs> it's an important way to make the joke and then to apologize for it immediately after. Well, I didn't apologize for the joke. He said he wasn't sure if that was the actual name. That is true. Huh. Yeah, thank you, Billy. Uh, so they're all just like little Arison kids? or just... uh, No. This is important. To, I no, don't the watch little Arison the key. kids are running the team. <laughs> They're, they're handling the salary cap. The Ellisburg kids are handling handling the Got salary a calculator. Cap. They're like, <laughs> it's Cassie Crotty. An unnecessary correction. <laughs> now Stugatz cares about journalistic integrity yeah, yeah. and getting names right. When it's I, coming after like an eight year old. I left out. He has two daughters. I left out Connor. I don't know if either of them are. Crotty. We don't need all of that information. Leave the Crotty yeah, children I, alone. I, we don't need any of it. Actually, anything that Billy, Chris, and Stugatz have said the last few seconds, not useful in any way, not helpful in any way, not Getting surprising. Name right, then. not surprising. I pointed out the Arisons were running the team. That is correct. Is yes, it not? It is, is not. Nick Arison not? <laughs> if Nick Arison doesn't work for the Heat, am I wrong about that? Is he not related to Mickey? Oh, yes, he is. They just found the two Arisons working together. I, I, I thought you had the Arison <laughs> grandkids. I thought you had the Arison grandkids. On not not a thirty five year old or a forty year old human being. Mickey's older. The yes. next step. age yeah. as do adults. Thank you, Stugatz. Thank you, Billy. Uh, can we please play the sound though? Because Tony uh, was a little harsh. Uh, what is the background? Harsh. Where, where oh. you, you were harsh. You were harsh. harsh. No, no, this, no, this, absolutely no. not. I'm Dan. This is the most electric. National anthem of all time it, at a Pacers game by this little girl. I don't know her name, by the way. You need to get it. But at Electric, when I, when I, it was, we, me and my wife watched this like 20 times.
I mean, electric or not, Dan? You tell I, me. I bless America. I felt bad about myself a couple of times during the heat broadcast because I'm looking at the television and I want the kids to turn down the confidence just a little bit. Just, just, to, just. They should work here for a week. <laughs> just a couple of notes. Turn down the confidence. Just a couple of notes. I don't want. I don't want a plethora of insecure kids roaming the earth. I don't wish upon them insecure a lifetime of insecurity. That's what you're doing, Dan. <laughs> Turn down the confidence. Listen, guys. Kids that are that are watching this. Obviously, you're watching this because you love the show. Uncle Tony's got something to tell you. <laughs> Listen, don't ever let uno viejo lower your confidence. Okay, never. Always put your confidence up. You can do anything you want. <laughs> all right. So uh, all of a sudden, I've got nobody who wants to rip kids. Barry Jackson's the only brave one among us <laughs> anywhere in the media willing to rip kids. Everyone is now afraid, is afraid to rip kids. I believe Mike Lupica made this mistake one time on Letterman and was never. He invited. ripped a kid? Yeah, on Letterman? Ripped, yeah, I think really? Not, yeah, I think he was never wow. invited back. You got to be careful. You got to be careful with the public ripping of kids. In the defense of Barry Jackson, he just wants there to be a separate adults oh, broadcast yeah. in in at like alongside the kids broadcast. He doesn't want to be forced oh. to watch the kids broadcast. That's how he's defending himself. Sense. Isn't he at the game? Isn't he not even watching the broadcast That's a great anyway? Point, Tony, it's a great lane for him. Honestly, I'm jealous he got it first. Are they not <laughs> vetting national anthems? Oh. Like, was this like? What, what, that, they what just, happened? Did they what see her adorable dress and they're right. like, "You can go. You're good." It doesn't matter what you sound like. Oh, what? What does that mean? Sound what? like? Damn, I'm just Chris, saying. What does that mean? Like, it doesn't matter great. what she sounds I mean, like. The parents, the team. I'm not bl- like she's just a kid trying to live her dream. Yeah, I blame the team. Who approved this? The team. The te- oh. He almost got through this segment unscathed, and Chris Cody just had to swoop in. With- I think she did a great job. She did. Yeah, she it was electric. Very, really cute. The growl at the end, like, Rrr! dude, mm-hmm. I love that. What a coward you are. <laughs> a kid. I heard you all in the meeting beforehand, and then nothing. <laughs> You <laughs> fell for it again. <laughs> he left you. He left you all alone. Everyone had stuff ripping the kid right up until the lights went on. Not everyone. Adam Schefter is going to join us here in a little bit to talk about Chris Mortensen. And I think I have my memory on this correctly, Stugatz, because um, I remember when Adam Schefter was coming up, the landscape at that time was owned by Chris Mortensen. And Chris Mortensen made a very wide berth, a very wide space to help Adam Schefter, Mm -hmm. uh, to teach Adam Schefter. And I remember watching it on television where Schefter became bigger than Mort as an information insider guy with the blessing of Mort, because Chris Mortensen was always uh, grateful for the position that he had and uh, graceful about how he shared it with others. It's a notoriously insecure business. It's a notoriously competitive business. And we will talk to Adam Schefter about that. Uh, But Roy has put together a montage here to remember Chris Mortensen the way our show remembers him. I will say it again, Chris Mortensen, over a lifetime in journalism, has done uh, big, incredible work. Hello, Mort. Hello, Stugatz. How are you? I miss you, buddy. I miss you. Same here. Let's talk some football here. Stugatz has been uh, lapsing in and out of withdrawal. I have. I've missed him, and I'm jonesing for Mort, and I'm tapping my wrist right now. I'm finding a vein, and I'm injecting Chris Mortensen into my vein. Yeah, I do want to acknowledge one thing. You never wavered on Brett Favre. Thank you, Mort. One hundred percent. Thank you, Mort. And you tweeted it out for me to all your to your Twitter fans. Now, I know I got to remember to remind people that for, for everybody who's taking credit for anything, thank you, Mort. Only one voice. Thank you. Only one voice in the wilderness said a hundred percent and never blink. You're the Farve expert. Anything you find illuminating or found illuminating or interesting or revelatory about Bill Parcells being introduced this week? Well, he, he put me to sleep more than he normally does. Chris Mortensen with us on 790. The first pick in Chris Mortensen's fantasy food draft is? Buffalo wings. Excellent choice. Second pick in Chris Mortensen's fantasy food draft is? Guacamole. Wow. The third, very high. You took a very, very high. That's a reach. The third pick in Chris Mortensen's fantasy food draft is? Spring rolls. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's singing it. He's, he's really enjoying this. It's wacky more. You know, he's been changed ever since he fell down that flight of stairs. Yeah, so I had knee surgery last Wednesday, too. So that is uh, That was great, by the way. That commercial is great. You falling down a flight of stairs is really funny. They used we had fun. It was a stunt double, right? No, come on. The fourth pick in Chris Mortensen's fantasy food draft is... Quesadilla! And the fifth pick in Chris Mortensen's fantasy food draft, is that a chicken quesadilla, is your shrimp quesadilla, or just plain cheese quesadilla? Cheese quesadilla. Plenty of pico de gallo and what have you, you know? And the fifth one? Potato skins. <laughs> Let's go to Bill. Bill, you're on with ESPN's Chris Mortensen. Go ahead. Hey, Bill. Bill got so bored he dropped off. <laughs> <laughs> you're about to break a big story, aren't you, Mort? Uh, actually, I'm getting one shut down. You're getting one oh. shot down, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of stories you don't report. <laughs> you want to feel free to share any of this on the air with us, Mort. I mean, go ahead. Yeah, well, if it were true, I'd, uh, <laughs> I, I still couldn't. <laughs> Mike, uh, can you play something to lighten this up, please? Do you have anything to lighten this up? Mortensen. I feel like we're interrogating <laughs> we Chris are. Mortensen. Like, I mean, I don't think this is like a single swinging light bulb of interrogation. <laughs> it's in a dingy room. Like, I'm about to hit his forehead on the on the table of a desk. Mortensen. Mort, we've uh, been trying to get an answer on this. I'm still not certain we've arrived at any sort of, of answer. Are the Raiders for real? <laughs> yes, they are for real. Oh, wow. 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 Big day. <laughs> I mean, was that a question? That's I mean, a good that reaction a from you, question? Mort. That's the right question. That, that is the right way to react to that asinine question. Gamera, put it on the poll. Who's more fundamentally decent? Wow. Chris Mortensen or Tim Kirkshin? Oh, 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 not so certain. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Mort's on the line now, so I say Mort. But if Kirkshin was on the line, I'd say Kirkshin. They're both beautiful people. <laughs> Let me say this. Here's, here's one way you guys have, have, have captured me. I actually go and fill out those polls. I, I, I play your poll game. So if that was put up on the uh, put up, I'm voting for Kirsten. I think when you go into a very deep, private, intense battle, personal battle, even though it, 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 it's really within the confines of yourself, uh, I would say myself, my God, my family. Uh, I mean, yeah, you you know, you realize that you're 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 on the brink of. And, and my life is, is, is life ending here on earth and, and beginning anew and an and, and eternity. That's my faith, as you know. Uh, but at the same time, is when you're in it, you're really kind of in a fight for, I, I would say, it's four hours at a time a day. And even now, uh, there, there are instances with, when that's true. But uh, it's just uh, there were just some things physically that uh, I needed to focus on. And uh, in, in, in handling this this cancer uh, disease that so many people in this country are doing, enduring, or sub- succumb to, uh, you know, as I speak. This is one of the uh, most solid guys we've got around here in terms of journalism, in terms of character, in terms of being a person that people like and respect in this industry, where a lot of times we don't like and respect the media. You're not going to hear a lot of folks say anything bad about Chris Mortensen. Put it on the poll, please, Juju at Lebetard Show. Spring rolls, underrated or overrated? Uh, Chris Mortensen, Stugat, uh, I had my own relationship with him. You had your own relationship yep. with him. When I think of him, though, the relationship I think of was the one that he had with my father. He would always go out of his way to call my father. Few people found my father as funny and entertaining as Mort did, and he would call him all the time, even though I'm not totally sure if they ever met. Like, he would call my dad, and I'd, sure. I'm not, I, don't, I don't think they actually met in person. Uh, they may have, but they had, uh, they had a friendship, and you had your own friendship with him. He was a great man. I was thinking a lot about Mort after the news broke yesterday. The last time I saw him was at the Hall of Fame uh, when Tony Baselli got in, and he gave me a gigantic hug, and I love that man. Uh, but Mort, over the 20 years, Dan, because I remember the first segment you did on this show. You kicked me out of the studio. Our owner was in the studio with you with a camera in your face. You were very breathy. But in between those breaths, you said, Stugatz and I have no idea what's going to happen in the NFL, but we'll bring on voices and they'll tell you what's going to happen in the NFL. And one of those voices for many, many years on a weekly basis was Chris Mortensen. Our audience loved him. 
But I remember thinking, because Mort was such a big deal back then, and the news-breaking stuff became so popular with the audience back then because it, there was a newness to it, that having Mort on every week, he was one of the building blocks of this radio show. He gave us credibility. He lent us his credibility on a weekly basis because you were right. We have no idea what's going on in the NFL. But Mort did, and it made our show, a little local show in Miami, feel really big and really credible, and I've always been thankful to Mort for that. There are a couple of things about him, and again, I will tell you that in a little bit we'll talk to Adam Schefter, who had the most personal of relationships with him. But to hear in the outpouring and the grief um, that beyond credibility, which is something that a whole lot of media people are having a lot of trouble with, and beyond even being able to make all of these special relationships in the league where Peyton Manning and others trust you implicitly. We just talked about Caleb Williams and Draymond Green and contentious attitudes with the media. In some ways, Peter King uh, retiring and Chris Mortensen passing away, these kinds of relationships go with them. Athletes are not going to have yes. these kinds of relationships with future media members, but beyond Beyond the credibility in the relationships, what I will tell you is the, the sheer number of people echoing at every turn, decency and kindness, those two words, uh, it's just not something that you find a whole lot in media members. The, the, I, that combination of things where has the relationships, has the credibility, and also is seen as somebody who is fundamentally kind and decent. Stephen A. Smith and an assortment of other famous people have a ton of relationships, but you just don't hear of many reporters ever in the history of this craft who leave such an indelible, indelible mark that uh, people are perpetually talking about feeling his spirituality, that he was obviously somebody who was faith-based and tried to live his life in a way um, that just sent kindness everywhere. And I don't know about you. Obviously, I've been dealing with an assortment of uh, pains related to grief. But last week, we're mourning the death of Richard Lewis. Like, I, I, it seems like mortality is creeping closer and closer around here when, uh, you know, we're back-to-back -back weeks. We're feeling some of this stuff that makes it a little difficult to, you know, do your no normal jovial bullshit stuff that we do around here i mean these were guys that were both richard lewis and chris mortensen that were that were on with us with mort it was different there was a real friendship there you had it i had it it was on air it was off air richard lewis was more on air alan thick i met him once like it was more on air but these are people who meant a lot to us along the way it meant a lot to our audience as well i know our audience is feeling today uh, the passing of Chris Mortensen. Mort did local events down here with us. Mort always made time for every single person who showed up to those events. He was just a, uh, he was a wonderful, kind person. Uh, play the sound of Al Davis uh, ripping Chris Mortensen going through the microfiche. I'm looking for the full press conference. We have so many clips of just the word. I'm looking for the full uh, okay, one. Okay, well, well, the word, the Al Davis, the former Raiders owner, when you ask him if the Raiders are for real, Mortensen's answer was, yes, they exist in <laughs> Oakland. That's all he gave you. Uh, but he uh, he feuded. I don't even remember. What was the report? It was, it was about Lane Kiffin. It was Al Davis was super mad that Lane <laughs> Kiffin had done an assortment of things as the coach of the Raiders, and he went up in front of uh, a gathered media with microfiche. Do, do the young people in the room even know what microfiche is? Do Jessica Very and small fish? <laughs> microfiche. That's it. Yeah, right. That's Isn't it, it. microfilm? Fish. What is fish? Fish. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I called it, I, I don't know whether it's the brand. I called it when I was in high school, I called it microfiche. But this was this was Al Davis who was just ripping Chris Mortensen. And everyone sided with Mortensen because Al Davis was a loon and because the way he said Mortensen was Mortensen. funny. Mortensen. <laughs> Mortensen. What is microfiche? Uh, <laughs> I already told you. Small fish. <laughs> Small fish. Have, you, have you wavered on Brett Favre yet? <laughs> I wish. That is uh, that is directed at you, Stugatz. <laughs> 
nice, uh, nice thing to say at the eulogy, Billy. As we've mentioned, it's a brutal day for people who cared about Chris Mortensen, and there were a lot of them. He passed away mm -hmm. Sunday morning at the age of 72, a legend, a pioneer. And I think Adam Schefter will tell you, because I felt like I saw it happen on television, Adam Schefter was helped by Mort at every turn in a way that didn't seem threatening to Mort. And a lot of people in this business would have been threatened by Adam Schefter, but we'll get uh, his words. Thank you, Adam, for making the time for us. Can you tell us about your relationship with Mort? Yeah, I mean, it transitioned, Dan, and I appreciate you having me and my condolences to Mort's wife, Mickey, and his son, Alex, who he loved very much and talked about all the time. But my relationship with Mort was such where when I was at NFL Network and when I was a Denver newspaper guy, I looked at Mort as a legend in the business, somebody that I aspired to be like. There was Will McDonough. There was Mort. Um, they were the ultimate newsmen. And... When my contract was coming up at NFL Network, I got a call yesterday from John Walsh, and he said, I want you to know how much more went to bat for you and was integral in bringing you to ESP. I said, I've, I've heard that, John. I know that people have brought that to my attention, that I'm not there without his support, without his recommendation, without his blessing. And he said, no, 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 I'm telling you, like he went to bat. You know, we got to get this done. And, um, you know, I, I always knew it, but it's another thing to hear it again on the day that we lose him. And, um, you know, he changed the trajectory of my life just as he changed the trajectory of so many other lives. You know, go ask Daniel Jeremiah what Mort did for him. Go ask Jeff Darlington what Mort did for him. Go ask so many people around ESPN. And... He went from being a legendary newsman in my eyes, one of the greatest reporters in sports history, uh, to becoming uh, a friend, an advisor, uh, somebody that I would lean on, learn from. Um, he was the best. He was the best. How uncommon is it in this competitive of a business, Adam, yeah. for all of what you said to be so? Because I found it deeply uncommon about him. The fact that everyone is talking about decency and kindness today. That's the word, decency. That's the word. And, you know, yesterday after, he, after, he, after we lose him, I can't tell you the number of people that reached out that shared their experiences with more more and here's the thing about it they were all incredibly thoughtful like him they were all remarkably decent like him and you know i get a text yesterday from chris ballard who's you know who seemed all emotional the coach general manager about how much mort supported his son playing football this year like nobody would have known that and chris was lamenting the fact that his son didn't get to meet more in person. Peyton Manning forwarded me, forwarded me seven, eight emails of emails that Mort had sent him through the years. And you just read them. And um, they're incredible in their thoughtfulness and support and just how much he cared for Peyton and people, not just Peyton. Um, I have those emails. Uh you know, so, you know, it's hard. I, I, you know, we spoke this week and, uh, you know, the, the, the irony is he actually sounded good to me this week. You know, there was a period um, during the season where uh, he had pneumonia. We were worried about him. Um, and uh, we were worried about him at that time. And, and he came back. We have this chain of coworkers, a text chain. And Mort's on it. And uh, our boss, Seth Markman, has pointed out to us how, how much life that brought to Mort, how much enjoyment, uh, just observations of the football world, the business, the world, whatever it would be. And, um, you know, when, when Mort went quiet for a couple of weeks in December, we got concerned. And then he was back to life, so much so that at 746 
on Saturday night. He was texting with us. Um, and then he's gone Sunday morning. So, um, you know, it's amazing because it was such a insidious disease that he was fighting, but he really had done pretty well with it. And, and, uh, we thought he was out of the danger zone and then he went to sleep and just didn't wake up. So, uh, you know, we'll see what the autopsy shows, but I just think he had been through so much physically. And even though he had been doing better um, inside, I think he was just, uh, he was beaten up. Adam, Dan mentioned how uncommon uh, Mort's, Mort's ability to be able to help and to want to advance people's career is in our industry. And yeah. he is right. And so I'm wondering, were you surprised upon meeting him, how willing he was to help you? to promote your career, to eventually make you what you are today, which is the number one NFL information guy in the industry. You know, when I got hired there, um, again, with his support, with his full support, um, we went to dinner in New York City, Smith and Walensky. And it was the first time that I ever had the chance to sit down with him at length. I had met him before. Um, we had talked before. But, um, you know, I hadn't had a chance to sit down and talk to him like that. And we talked about our families. We talked about our approach to the job. We talked about life. And he was such a regular guy. Um, and the thing about him, and you guys knew him, um, he was somebody who in any room would be the single funniest guy in that room. And the guy who also would be the most credible guy in that room. You know, he was the only guy, you know, that could, in the war room on Sunday, go make fun of Boomer. <laughs> just mercifully, just go at him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he had people laughing so many times. He had an unbelievable sense of humor that people, uh, I, I don't know if they really know. You know, I... I mentioned in the obituary that we did on ESPN, you know, that, that Bill Tobin interview that he did with him, he set him up for that, for that great soundbite on Mel Kuyper Jr. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew where it was going to go. He kind of asked the question and sat back and got to me the greatest soundbite in NFL draft history with Bill Tobin saying, who the hell is Mel Kuyper? Um, you know, Mort had that little devilish side to him. Um, he was a very, very funny guy, very funny guy. And, uh, uh, yeah. And he, he was instrumental, uh, in the lives of so many different people. Like yeah, my story is my story. And there'd be a hundred other stories of people that Mort helped. So that's just who he was. You have some experience with grief. I don't know if, yep. you know, this was 2016 that he powered through stage four throat cancer. So you've had yeah. 10 years of warning that this day might come, right? But there is no real warning, correct, for the thudding finality of what no. somebody feels on Sunday no. morning. No. Um, uh, you know, we were sitting there at breakfast yesterday or lunch. It was about... 1230, I got a call uh, for my boss. And, and he told, I, I was like, I was completely floored. Like I, I was in shock and my daughter started crying. Um, and uh, it was a very emotional moment at our family table. Um, and like I said to you, he, he was doing better. He, he really was like, yeah, uh, there were, there were any number of times during the past eight years or so uh, that we thought he was in danger, um, that he was gravely ill. But I, I, I didn't think I was getting that call yesterday. Like, you know, I, I just didn't think that uh, I was getting that call. And, and that's, you know, that's the uh, sad part, aside from all that his family loses and his wife and son who were so dependent and loved him so much. Um, but, you know, we, there wasn't a time to say goodbye. Uh, you know, sit with him and share things. Dan, you've talked about your brother eloquently. And you've had time 
to sit with him in his final weeks and days, right? And and even though we had chances to tell Mort how much we loved him and appreciated him, you know, we we didn't know the end was coming yesterday. That surprised everybody, including his own family. So um, just very sudden. And, you know, there, there's no way that it's ever going to be nice, whether it's a long drawn out process or whether it's quick and sudden. Um, but that's the way it went yesterday. And, uh, um, you know, you set. you knew him uh you knew him very very closely so i don't know if yeah. this is a dumb question to ask yeah. you i have a hard time imagining him angry hmm. uh i i just have a hard time imagining it do you did you see him angry very often yeah not not very often but i've seen him angry and i'm trying to think of exactly what it was you know he i think he obviously mellowed over the years uh he talked about i think having a temper you know when he was younger and and i said this to uh, who was i talking to yes somebody and uh you know it's amazing to me um when espn when i got hired at espn when mort signed off on that blessed it recommended it he at that time was 57 years old and i'm 57 now and so i understand at that point where he was and what he would have looked to have done and accomplish. Um, and so that anger, that temper, I think it dissipated over time. Um, and, and I'll just say this, like there may have been a couple of things that I had seen temper wise, but, but when I was the guy who was wound up or stressed or just really tight over, a story or something we had coming up. I mean, he was always the guy, always the guy that could deflate some of that tension from me. And, and, and I don't think there's anybody that could do that other than him, only him. You know, he was the guy that could make you laugh at the most stressful moments, you know, like it was just him. Um, you know, uh, I wish we had the clip. I can remember when uh, we were going through the Richie Incognito uh, bully gate scenario. And uh, that morning, you know, we came out of the report and uh, Richie started coming at me on social media. And, you know, Mort, you know, was a little bigger than me, you know, gets on TV and he's like, you know, Richie Incognito said, bring it. You know, Mort gets on TV like a big brother. He's like, you want to bring, you want us to bring it, Richie? You come to me. Um, and that was Mort stepping in as a big brother uh, to defend his little brother who was being picked on. You know, that was Mort. What will you miss most about Mort, Adam? Everything. Everything. Um, just who he was, uh, the man he was, the decency he had, uh, what he meant to his family, what he meant to his friends. The humor, the laughs, the memories, all of it. Um, you know, I don't know how you sum up a life well lived like that, but uh, you know, that was my, you know, like I said, uh, we spoke this past week for 15, 20 minutes, Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, I invited him, you know, there was a function going on in, on the East Coast. And I said, why don't you come stay at my house this June? And he said, uh, you know, I can't even think about June right now. Um, we'll talk, to, we'll talk about it when I get there. I said, okay, you, you got it more, but I'd love for you to stay here. You know, I'd love for you to come spend the weekend and hang out. Um, and, and I guess that was affirmation that he knew, um, that he wasn't counting on any time, even if he was in my mind doing better. So, um, that's kind of where he's at. When you ask me what I remember about him, I'll remember how much I loved him and how much he meant to me and how much he meant to so many people. How moved were you by the outpouring yesterday? Because it was, uh, it was nice to hear everyone have consensus of opinion on how, yeah. how it is they were touched by him. It, 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 it turned it into truth for people who may not have known him to hear it from so many different places. Yeah. Well, 
uh, this is not to diminish him. I mean, that, that's what happens when somebody, you know, passes a lot of times. Um, but with him, all of it was real and all of it was true. You know, a lot of times when people go, people talk about what a great person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and many times it's right, but you know, with him, it was all true. And then some, it was all true. Um, that's how great he was. Adam, thank you for making the time. We won't uh, we won't bother you with any of the mundane football questions you're used to yeah. getting this time of year. <laughs> uh, heartbroken on your behalf and uh, broken yeah. in general. Thank you for being yeah, on. Thank with you us, guys. Adam. I appreciate me and allowing us to celebrate more a little bit here. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. Jessica, I would like a numerical answer to this question. What number person was I this weekend to text you the video of Sam Hartman running in slow motion with flowing hair, giving off a little bit of Momoa, uh, Jason Momoa, just uh, regal and slow motion, uh, sexy and tan. Uh, did, uh, Did a lot of people send you this? Honestly, Dan, people don't send me videos of Notre Dame stuff because everyone in my life knows that I've already seen them. And I think people get sick of me being like, haha, I've seen this. So, yeah, you might have you might have been the only one, actually. OK, because everyone else just knew better. They knew that you had, you had already seen Sam Hartman in slow motion, melting hearts all over the Internet. So that was slow motion. huh? I thought he was just slow. <laughs> <laughs> he just thought that was the speed of a, a nine Notre six. Dame quarterback. <laughs> it was incredible, though. There was also another video, which um, I hopefully will get up here, of a NFL media person interviewing him. There was a lot of questions he got at the Combine about his hair. And a lot of people just asking him, like, what, what's your hair routine? What do you put in your hair? All this, like, That's our lane. And it's like, I, I love that the Combine now has embraced some of the silliness, but Sam Hartman must have had the strangest weekend of his entire life just being thirsted after by all of the NFL media. I wish, I'm, I'm sure Caleb Williams would have liked some more of those gentle hair-related questions as opposed to, are you afraid to compete? First thing, he doesn't even sit down. <laughs> hey, are you, are you scared? <laughs> and Sam Hartman sits down and they're like, you're hot! What? You! you. There were, like, ah. There's not a gray in there, man. It looks great. I mean, it's silky, too. It's not just that it's black. It's resplendent. It's obvious the man is running with conditioner in his hair well, and and always plays with conditioner in his hair. Apparently, there's nothing in there. It's I don't, just natural. He said it's good genes. Do you think he ever considered tying the hair up? He or, was rocking a man bun during really? some of his training in this earlier this winter. Yes, Chris. Man. Yeah. Put it on the poll, please, Juju at Lebitard Show. Do we have to test Sam Hartman's hair for steroids? <laughs> uh, there were a couple of things this weekend in football, Stugatz. A couple of uh, well, one rule change that was talked about that Billy is, uh, I think, furious about, and uh, another one that I am very happy to see. Uh, they are now testing. I did not know this until this weekend. They are they tested at the Super Bowl and in other places the ability to remove the chain gang as the way that they oh, measure in that no. sport. They're talking about finding the technology. They've tested the technology. They have some optical things that work but will not work for 2024. So we will still have the antiquated yes. measuring system in a billion in a multi-billion dollar sport where they're fighting for real estate over <laughs> inches we're still going to measure it with chains this year but soon that will be gone so it's so high tech this this new tech that they have is so high tech it's not ready for next year but we will still have elon musk trying to put chips inside of people's brains we still have the chips inside the the helmets and inside the shoulder pads but we can't get the chip inside the ball just yet not yet you've got optical tracking and they're still testing it i and hate it, that it has to have a vote they've got a vote on it too there might be look man these owners are old they might cling to their chain vote measurements. It down. <laughs> they might they might vote down look it would not surprise me if these owners are so stubborn about advancement that That'd they're like great. no we're gonna vote it down but uh it will not happen this year 
I was kind of hoping that if we had this technology in tennis, we'd figure out how to have it in football. We were talking about the show. When they go away, you're going to miss the chain gang. Mm -hmm. You're going to miss them walking out onto the field very slowly, the tension that comes with them doing the measurement. Mm -hmm. You're going to miss screaming in your living room, short! I love doing that. Right before, like right when they get to the ball and they lift it up and as they're extending it, I'm the first one in my living room. It's short. No, you got to do this. Oh, yeah, you show with your hands. Put your yeah. hands up. Yeah. This is how short it is. Mm-hmm. Or your fingers. Hubba, hubba. Or I your think fingers. we keep the chain gang even after we go to technology. Microfiche. Just have them out there? <laughs> I think they're there just for show. Even after we have a, a chip in the ball, even after we don't need them anymore, I still want them jogging out there. Mm-hmm. Put it on the poll, please, Juju. Will you miss the chain gang in football at Lebetard show? It won't feel like football without the chain gang. Yeah. I'm telling you, it won't. What's even the argument against them? Mm-hmm. No, they don't actually, dude. They are so often so accurate. Like, we have to ch- – what, you challenge maybe one or two things a game? Well, you only get one yeah, or two challenges. Rest, no, I'm saying for yeah. both teams. Like, But, no, you do – if you get it right, you get more than one challenge. The chain gang is different. The chain gang does 10 yards at a time. They don't do anything. I don't feel like we've had very many chain gang controversies. I have told you guys before, (laughs) this sport seems hard to officiate. We argue and yell about a lot of different things. The placement of the football is not something we spend a lot of time arguing about. I'm surprised how often they get that one right. I, That's I mean, not I, true. I feel like we always argue over bad spots. Uh, or mm-hmm. like yeah. a couple bad fans spots. that feel like they get screwed over them argue over them. Even if this technology exists, though, we're still going to argue about how much we hate the technology. Like, mm-hmm. this is torn apart soccer for years. The VAR and offsides yeah. and everything. That's why I stopped watching. It doesn't get easier. Like, to Jess's point, the VAR has not made it less. Like, people are getting so mad more than ever about soccer stuff, and there's plenty of VAR in there. You think that uh, we don't do that particularly well? I know officiating in general is something that we complain about every week, but I feel like the spotting of the ball, it seems to me that given how hard it is to know this is where the ball was when his knee landed over here, that we don't complain about it that much given that there's human error going to be involved. I'm surprised they get that right as often as they do. We don't really know if they're getting exactly it right. Exactly right. That's the thing. And we only game of do, inches, right? We they only show the it. replays, no. and you're always like, ah, You yeah. pay attention on consequential plays. There's that's lots of that's plays that's that you're not looking to see where the thing true. was. So much so that Jason Kelsey even admitted, and every lineman we've oh. talked to since, and told us, like, yeah, just move the ball six, seven inches every play. No one noticed. No one was paying attention. I'm just saying there's sports fans out there. I'm not one of them, but they <laughs> exist that can look back at every single loss that their team has yeah. had over the last 20 years and blame a spot for it. Not saying I'm one of them, but I don't know. Steelers might have 25 Super Bowls if it weren't for (laughs) this technology not existing. Jason Kelsey is retiring today, right? There's a press conference. Well, he's holding a press conference, Dan. You can't hold a press conference to say you're coming back for another year. That would be a jerk move. You can't do that. I hope it's related to his podcast. That'd be great. (laughs) I'm getting texts now from my mom. The Kelsey podcast is affecting my life. I, my mom sent me like in the, like 11 o'clock last night some clip from them. I guess they were crying or something together. And she's like, treat your brother better. Oh, it's not. And, and it's yeah. just like, it's what did you watch the clip she sent you? No. <laughs> what? I, I just saw that there was like the headline said something with crying. But I'm just like, I treat my brother fine. Like, why am I getting punished? Because these two are bonding over a podcast. The Kelsey brothers were weeping on their podcast about something? There was something? somewhere, it was. It might have been an old clip of Jason when he was just wa- uh, talking about watching his brother celebrate. He got emotional and he was crying. So, And it touched your mother's heart. Exactly. And then you shit all over that. Well, no, it, it touched my mother's heart to be like, hey, be, be like, and it's like, I'm not, me and my brother have a good relationship. Like, I don't know where it came from. It's not like we're fighting right now. She was just like, <laughs> She's be tell- nicer to your brother. I'm right. like, okay. But I am nice to my brother. Right. I'm with you. Like, that's annoying. It's Kelsey's. Why are they affecting? Like, like, why is this happening? Why is my mom seeing the clip? And why is my mom texting me? Be where, nicer where to your brother. Where is she seeing it? Like Instagram reels or something? Yeah, I think so. Facebook probably. My wife does the same thing with Jason, Kelsey and his wife. Like, she's always sending me clips, Jason and his wife, and what a great family they are, and what a great husband he is, and why can't you be more like Jason Kelsey? Hey, give Jason me Kelsey's wife, was all she talks about how she doesn't want to be in the limelight, and then she was at some gala last yes. week now. Right. Oh, yeah. Let me see the Hartman video here before I go to uh, Billy, because, Billy, I want to get to you on the onside, uh, the onside kick rules changing. Stupid rule change. Uh, uh, but let's go real quick here, Sam Hartman. Uh, uh, walking us through his hair routine. Can you walk us through your hair 
skincare routine? Uh, yeah, I was probably I was born with it. It's called the wake up and go. It's this uh, crazy thing where you just wake up, put water in your hair, and you go dead serious. There's nothing in here. Wake up and go. All Shout right. out moms. You can feel it. Like I'm being dead serious. Yeah, like, it's there's I nothing. I mean, yeah, there's no product. There's nothing in here. That can't be. I, I want to feel him. it so bad. Yeah, I want to fight him. Do you think his draft yeah. stock's gonna go down for lying about his hair? <laughs> I, I don't think he's lying, but Billy does. Is he turning on the voice there? Hey, that voice is like, I'm very, I know how good looking I am. So He's going to be I a boss deeper right? because yeah, of how sure. good looking I am. His voice did have a little bit of an Irish Springs commercial in it. It did, uh, it did have That's a That's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Well, Irish Springs. He had other hair related NIL deals this past year, so maybe that was a <laughs> conflict. He's also got to be full of it, right? I mean, that's, that, there's product in there. That is luscious hair. That can't it, just be wake up, him. water, and go. I believe him. It seems impossible. Uh, it is so. It is so beautiful, and so I don't. I understand why Jessica believes him. He's a. He's a good he Notre Dame boy. Good Catholic boy. Right. Good Notre Dame boy. He's, he's a Wake Forest. For <laughs> well, we'll see. Maybe he's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Who knows? A, Billy, yeah, what is what is it about the onside kick rules that's bothering you? They want to ruin it. Have you not seen what they want to do with the onside kick? First of all, for everybody that was complaining about the fact that the, the, the when the ball goes out of bounds on a touchdown that it becomes a touchback for the other team, they quickly move past that. So it seems like that's not going to change next season. They looked at it and they said like they only happened like four times out of 40,000 plays. Move on to the next one. So it seems like next season that's still going to be there. So Wait, you mean, people you are mean, saying that that shouldn't be a touchback? No, they were saying that that shouldn't – that. Yeah, they looked into whether or not that was too harsh of a punishment for the team to lose the ball and the other team to get the ball. When someone's reaching out to the goal line and loses the ball right before the goal line. The, the right. reason the Ravens season ended, in other words. That's right. Okay. But uh, <laughs> yeah. like it, the touchback, it it's not hard enough. It's yeah. not you know harsh enough. They yeah. should punish the you, They should take points off the board. Wow. You got to protect the ball. All right. <laughs> you know that's fair. It's not harsh enough. There has to be a bigger penalty. It's not Zay Flowers doesn't just have an echoing off season of shame where Baltimore's mad at him. It needs to be even worse than that. Game over. You lose. <laughs> there. <laughs> Fixed. Good rule. Immediate it's ejection. First, it's like the first drive of the game and someone fumbles right, into the end go. zone and they're like, all right, well, that's the game. But what are the rule changes on onside kick? Well, they're just, they got to announce it? Well, it's proposed. It hasn't passed yet, but they've been studying what to do with kickoffs and onside kicks. And what they want to do is you can only do an onside kick in the fourth quarter if you're trailing. Oh. And you have to tell the other team you're going to do an onside kick before you do what? it. What? That's crazy. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. I mean, you can't announce that you're doing it. It takes away from doing it, yeah. right? The surprise factor is why you do it. How many surprise onside kicks have there Sean been? Sean Payton Super Bowl. Boom. So one. McAfee. <laughs> McAfee, has McAfee one, did one. Time on his Two. Open. Yep, on his open. <laughs> Um, I, I think safety needs to be the primary Oh, enough. Concern. If you want to be safe, don't three. play football. Yeah, exactly. Stop football. Exactly, exactly. Football. exactly right. You want to be safe, play enough another sport. Please. Go play Stay tennis. Right. Enough. Enough Golf. with the safety. Yeah. Enough, enough with the safety. It's, it's gotten insane. Right. Yeah, put it on the poll, Juju. Enough with the safety. Go play tennis. Yes or no? <laughs> Stugat, uh, you know that Tony has been trying for several weeks. He has been workshopping uh, what has been a great question that has gotten a lot of response every time that he asks it, any room that he asks it in, except when we were trying to do it in Las Vegas in front of people <laughs> during a live show when Billy undercut him from the very start and ruined wow. the uh, ability to uh, ponder his question of whether – a player in baseball who went one for four in every single game with a single for five straight seasons and had an 800-plus game hitting streak mm -hmm. would make it into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, first ballot. Uh, zero career home runs, zero cares? career extra base hits, <laughs> right. a, a, a career 500 OPS. Yeah, but DH doesn't play the field. A hit in every game he played. 810-game hitting streak. Mm -hmm. Chris Cody has now uh, put out this question to a series of people, okay? At the beginning, it was just Adnan Verk, Mike Schur, Boog Shambi, five people, five baseball authorities. Boog Shambi didn't answer, and the vote Still? came Still? Still waiting to hear back from Boog. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get it on to Billy because, like, I think you have a better shot yeah, at this than I do. Yeah. Classic Boog. I have not asked Boog. I did ask for you, Jeff Conine, and Craig Council. How many, how many people have you now asked? What? How many responses have you got? 16. 
Six. You want me to just rattle some names before I give you responses? We have Tino Martinez, wow. Bob Costas, Keith Oberman, Mike Schur, Craig Council, Rich Waltz, Kyle Seeloff, Bill Ripken, <laughs> Harold Reynolds, Carlos Pena. Wow. And I'm I got I, I got uh, sources. I uh, more I'm expecting more submissions tomorrow. But are as of right now, I have 16. Are you reaching out to all these people on your own? Or? I'm it's kind of. Right. My tentacles are yeah. okay. Hmm. I thought the five that we asked were supposed to be the definitive answer, right. no, and then we were going to right. go Correct. with Retire that. The question. I didn't like that history. answer. You can't contain this. Right. It's like the bigger than the five. What is this it, is five years and baseball. hit every I actually every thought day. it was mm-hmm. Kirchin who was going to decide this for us. I can ask Scott Rowland. I mean, yeah, sure, ask him. Okay. You have to play in Major League Baseball for 10 years to be eligible for the Hall of Fame. So A couple nerds not said even that. Eligible. Kirchin and Costas got in there quick with that, but we were, then we followed up. This is a hypothetical. Yes, we're, we're, we're putting that rule aside for this hypothetical. So you just are going to keep asking everyone until they say yes. No, it's not about yes. Billy, it's not about yes. It seems you because all the no's, the you just exercise. keep asking more people. No, it's the thought exercise for people in baseball, the real people that know. Okay, not like you who wants to undercut the, the real baseball. people that know. I'm trying to bring know. baseball back. By this conversation, we're going to see this on MLB Network one day. We're going to be like, wow, where'd that come from? Oh, here. It's never going to get to yes, because this isn't a question that serious baseball people will entertain as putting in the Hall of Fame. (laughs) But this is why, like, when you talk to little kids, they're like, I want to be an astronaut. You're like, okay, you can be an astronaut. Like, it's exactly that. Just tell them what they want to hear so the conversation ends already. The conversation is not ended because we're keeping it alive, but I'm guessing you're getting mostly no because that person is kind. It's kind of amazing that they kept playing that person, given that at some point after two and a half seasons of no extra base hits, you have to wave that person. No. You have to- now, all right. So look, where we left off was it was th- wave streak. that person. He's on base look. every game. I mean, yeah, but he's he's on base one every four he's a times. Triple away though. It's not I mean. a good on base percentage. He's a bad baseball player. Let he's, me just let me just update the. Awesome. Audience, where we're at. He's so, a bad offensive player. What? Where we left off last week, we had three no's. Tim Kirkjian said if an NBA player makes a three in 400 straight games, averages three points a game, no assists, no plays no D, he's not a Hall of Famer. That was Tim Kirkjian's rebuttal. Mike Schur also voted no. He said it would be exciting every time he started a game over three, though. Okay, but but they point. would break into coverage and everyone would hate this guy because they'd break into coverage for a crappy player every time he's 0 for three. This like is, Mike sure said. This is what Craig Council said actually, because Craig Council's response. Spoiler alert. Uh, well, I'm going to give him this one, but you can give them the other one. You have plenty of others, and now Stugatz is also texting Scott Rowland. Wait, you you're yeah. texting Craig Council? Yeah. I want to sing "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" at Wrigley Field. You can make this happen. Wow. wow. So so I mean, boo good. I mean, uh, if he responded, uh, little right, stu- and little he won't. Stugatz, uh, Craig Council's stu- closer. I feel right. like to the yeah. source. And that didn't take Jess long there. Also, Notre Dame guy. Little Stugatz and everybody. Yeah. Like you know, Craig Stugatz. Council. What can I can get? What can I get out of the deal? Exactly. Uh, but what he said is that is an ESPN Hall of Famer for sure. Huge ratings oh, yeah. for that ground ball through the six hole. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but late in the night, oh god, he did it. <laughs> And then Jeff Passan also said no. He said 500 OPS, awful. You can't reward someone for being consistently bad. So that's four no's we have because Dan just said Craig Council. Right. Respectfully, Jeff Passan, that's the opposite of consistently bad. He is consistently okay. Dude, right. one for four. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, I'm okay. waiting on Scott Rowland. I'm waiting for a response. I also just asked Jabba Chamberlain. How about that? Oh, my God. Our oh, only wow. yes never gonna answer as you. of last week was Adnan Verk. And it was like a yeah. After he was like, we are. I already talked about this. He it was very un. Un. He knows the drill. He did not think it through. Oh. I got another yes. Exactly, Billy. Greg Cody says yes. Uh, Hall of Fame voter. How about that? I had to ask him. He's a Hall of Fame voter. Another yes. Tino Martinez. Wow. Taylor really? knows his son. That's how we got to him. Well, Adnan Verk, Adnan, you, Billy, you accuse Chris of the thing I think you need to be accusing Adnan Verk of because once he found out that he was the only yes, he started asking other people the question on Chris Cody's behalf. This is how this metastasized is because Adnan Verk wanted more yeses, not Chris Cody. And well, that, 
Go ahead, Billy. No, that's how it's going to end up on MLB Network is he'll ask someone one well, day on one of his shows. I tried. I was like, Adnan, you can have this because I know Tony would love it if that question ends up on MLB Network. Are we just like texting all the baseball players we know yeah, this question yes, now? Yes. All right. I, I could probably get a few names. Okay. Send, hey, send it off. Yeah. Nice. All right. So right now, as far as I've announced, we have but four no's. How long are we going to stretch this out? We've already talked about it on four shows. We're four to three right now. But when Harold Reynolds enters the game. Oh, wow. Wow. That's okay. a fourth yes. We are tied 4-4. Four, four. Yeah. Really? Harold Reynolds says he did something no one has ever done, but factually on the hypothetical, he wouldn't get in. So he's basically saying That's he would no. never get in. No, no, but he's but, saying but, he would vote for him. He's saying yes, but he's like he'll never get in, but I'd vote for him. Yes. Oh, okay. Craig Mish says no. Oh, no. Wow. We are at 5-4 now. Jeremy just told me that. Jeez. No, that Supreme six, Court four. over here. Roy. No, I think it's five. I don't know. All right, I know we have four yeses. That's what I know for a fact. Yeah. Huh. Craig Council says no. Rich Waltz says no. Rich Waltz, former Marlins broadcaster, says that team that kept him in the lineup at DH should be disbanded. <laughs> <laughs> disbanded. <laughs> they have the highest rating that eventually. Disbanded is yes. what he wrote. Disbanded, yeah. I, I think it also depends what market we're talking about here, too. Hmm. You guys want to hear from Keith Oberman? Yes. Yeah. Usually no. <laughs> oh. Nobody who hit more than 60 home runs is in the Hall of Fame. Two straight no hitters doesn't get you in the Hall of Fame. Two thirds of those who threw no hitters in a season aren't in the Hall of Fame. The guy who struck out 500 men in a season isn't in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I think that's a no for KO. <laughs> Applying yeah, logic. Like I mean, no. geez, what's the matter? I with just him? I just got patched into my headphones. Raul Ibanez. Oh. Okay. He says, says if you have an 800 game hitting streak, you're Jesus Christ. Mm. I don't Do think that's a direct wow. quote. That is an absolute direct quote from my But are you in the Hall of Fame? Is Jesus? Bill Ripken Should says be. no. Wow. Mm. Oh, face. Mm. Sure. Jeff Conine says no. He yeah. says a remarkable yeah. feat in an unremarkable career. Mm. Did you just call Bill Ripken a butt face? No, no. I called him old face. Worse. Oh. That's famous. That's his thing. It's wow. on his baseball card. Do you guys not know this? No. Yeah, Google Billy Ripken F face. Well, you. I will you, not do that. No, yeah, no do I'll it for real. No, do computer. it. It's oh, guys, a dangerous game, Billy. You guys don't know anything. Uncultured swine. No, he's right. Thank you. Mm. Finally, a smart person in this room. You want to go ahead and tell us this, the more of the story? His baseball card. His baseball card says it on the barrel of on, on the knob of his bat. It says F face, and it's a valuable baseball card because they didn't realize that it said F face. So there's all these baseball cards of Billy Ripken that say F face on it. And then they had to like go out and put one out that didn't say that because it says F face on it. Ah, it. So it's 10 5. Check back tomorrow for more votes. And it's not disbanded. <laughs> disbanded. It is time for his two guys to share his game notes. No one in the media will tell you what happened better than my boys, too. Weekend observations brought to you by Miller Life. Great taste, 96 calories available for delivery. Dan, he's far from his prime when he was terrorizing opponents on the pitch, both in England and in Spain, doing it while biting their ears in the process. And like most people, in their later years, he moved to Florida for a slower-paced life. But this weekend, he turned back the clocks, bringing his scoring boots with him and bagged a brace at a moment's notice. And Dan, just like that, make no mistake about it, with two goals in Inter Miami's win over Orlando City, Luis Suarez is back. I can't believe that you're, he's back. I'm, he's back. That's the most stunning he's back I've ever heard. Big soccer fan. You know that, Dano. Congratulations to Caitlin Clark for breaking the all-time NCAA scoring record previously held by Pete Maravich. Pistol Pete, just so we're clear, no. in my personal record book, no. it's still Pete's record. Because unlike Pistol Pete, Caitlin didn't do it in three years and did it with a three-point line. Uh, that, StuGatsBook.com. Why are you shaking your head? I mean, it's just give Pete some cred. Okay, it's important that we do that today. Oh, what do you mean? Instead of Caitlin 44 Clark, a game. It's I mean, important. She's great. I said she's great. It's Pete's record in my personal record book. Hey, Pete, do it on color TV. <laughs> Half of it he did, I think.
<laughs> Justin Fields, unfollow the Bears. Love that. Love it, man. What do you think he means by that? <laughs> Johnny Manziel, boycotting, uh, boycotting the Heisman Trophy presentation in support of Reggie Bush because it doesn't sit right with his morals. Dan, you know what the M in Manziel stands for? Moral. Yes. Well, look at you. <laughs> Following along. Johnny Morals. He did say he was humbly removing himself from the ceremony because it doesn't sit right with his morals and values. Humbly. <laughs> humbly. <laughs> Sam Hartman. Looks like a better looking Keanu Reeves. Yeah? It's just the hair. Well, he's better looking. It's just the hair. He's also 30 years younger, Stu Gatz. <laughs> we don't have to pit two good-looking men against each other. I'm just saying prime Hartman, prime Keanu. And prime Keanu, everyone knows, is point break. Who's better looking? Sam Hartman. Yeah? Thanks. <laughs> have, we, have we not talked about Eric Bieniemy going from Super Bowl-winning offensive coordinator to out of the league in two years? Life comes at you fast. Well, I, we didn't talk about just the job he had to take in a conference that's falling UCLA. apart for a team that nobody <laughs> wants to be a part of to be an associate head coach. <laughs> if you're ever looking for DePaul, you can always find them at the bottom of the Big East standings, the Blue Demons. Stash this away in the something to ponder file, Tony. Is Caitlin Clark the best athlete to never win a championship? No need to discuss it now. Just stash it away for a rainy day. I mean, it has to be her or Kevin Durant, right? Where did that shot at DePaul come from? He was just watching basketball this weekend. He's like, yeah. he hasn't paid attention to them since Dallas Comedies was there. The great Ray Meyer. <laughs> It's the last time they were any good. Some DePaul kid is listening to the show right now like, where did what, that come what, from? What, unnecessary. It's funny you guys mentioned this because I wrote down, thinking back, I'm not sure why you'd be looking for DePaul. Nobody is ever looking for DePaul. Chicago. Uh, is really looking for DePaul. That. It's in one of those I states it? that Dan thinks yeah. is one state. The Blue Demons. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve Martin. Sauce Gardner, in fairness... To McCole Hardman, the Jets' offensive game plan isn't the most difficult code to crack. First down, rush for three yards. Second down, rush for minus five yards. Third down, pray. Fourth down, punt. It's the way they've been doing it for 40 years. I hate them. That story, the McCole Hardman story, is great for a number of different reasons, but one of them is him allegedly selling the game plan or giving the game plan uh, to uh, the, was it the Eagles? Eagles and the Chiefs. But no, but then the Jets beat the Eagles. And like. they had their best <laughs> offensive game against the Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Notre Dame left tackle and projected top five pick. Joe Walt ran a five-second 40-yard dash at six foot, eight inches, and 321 pounds. They're not making O-linemen like they used to, Dano. How? I know. <laughs> <laughs> the Knicks winning on the road in Cleveland without Jalen Brunson. OG. I can't pronounce his last name. And Julius Randle. Gritty win. Behind 28 points from the Italian kid from Delaware, Dante DiVincenzo. <laughs> it's funny to like 12 people. You're one of them. No, not really. Uh, I'm not one of them. Chop Robinson is a great name. For a defensive lineman. Top 10 for me. Like, he's got to go in the top 10 just because of his name. That's great chop. <laughs> Inter Miami beating Orlando City 5 to nothing in the Battle of the Bright Line. Look at that. Messi. Do it in the... What? Huh? Do it in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup. LeBron. You score another 40,000. You'll never be him. LeBron, less points, more rings. Caitlin Clark, you too. The Wizards went 0 for 12 in February. The W in Wizards stands for winless. Top five athletes or entertainers. That Kenota Wizard. OLI, Ozzy Smith. Number five, Wiz Khalifa. 
Number four, John Wooden. Wizard of Westwood. Number three, Wandy Rodriguez. Number two, J.K. Dobbins. It's a rage. Number one. Thank you. I thank you, Tony. For Merlin Olson. <laughs> Tony doing a writing gesture with his hand. Yes, thank it's you. Writer, J.K. is an author. a writer. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank oh. you. <laughs> Watch out for Nashville. The Preds. PGA. Live. Golf. Getting chippy. <laughs> What's going on there, man? Those guys don't like each other. <laughs> They're fighting over money. <laughs> well, some guys took the money and some I, guys didn't. You know. can't blame the guys who took the money. Like, get over it. I thought you just meant well, they were using can, their I wedges guess. a lot. Yeah. Uh, Manchester is blue. Since Jake Dibbler took over at Ohio State, they are 4-1 and one with wins over Purdue, Michigan State. And now a 23-point beatdown of Michigan. Don't let the Buckeyes get hot. It's March, Dano. J.J. Watt should only play hockey in Lake Placid. The Warriors lost by 52 points to the Celtics. Steve Kerr, for your sake, I hope the ink is dry. That guy's ridiculous. What? What I mean, mean, he's ridiculous. $35 million for Steve Kerr? Get out of here. It's absurd. Michigan is 2-17 and 17 in the last 19 games. Jawan Howard, don't let the door hit you in the ass on your way out. <laughs> Put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Lebitard Show. Average age of the person who says, <laughs> don't hit the door, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. And then just put over, under, dead. I mean, it's Sorry unbelievable. I it, yeah. it's, it, like, what is that? I don't know. I have zero doubt J.J. Watt insists that the 1980 gold medal game was against Russia. The Soviets. It was against Finland, everyone. It wasn't Russia, but J.J. thinks it's Russia. He doesn't. I, I think he does. I'd be shocked if he doesn't. No. <laughs> you know, why, I, where, where is the straw man here on this thing? Where is it? There. <laughs> straw, straw man! man. I have zero doubt. It doesn't mean... If J.J. doesn't have Jim Craig and Mike Ruzioni in his top five athletes of all time, then I simply don't know what's what nowadays. <laughs> nowadays. Of all time. <laughs> if you ask J.J. Watt, top five athletes of all time, you don't think he's putting Jim Craig and Mike Ruzioni in there? It was a, Are you crazy? It was a hockey and game Ken Morrow? 45 years ago. J.J. Watt's not even 45. Oh. Oh, he doesn't care. Nobody gets why we're talking about J.J. Watt, Lake Placid, and the 19th uh, Because he's playing hockey over the weekend. He thinks you know that. I'm so confused. J.J. Watt was playing hockey, and he thinks we all knew that. Well, I mean. Get him in the goal. Looks we're, we're doing a goalie. sports show, I mean. Oh, you're going to judge people for not knowing about stories. I didn't know what happened to the Knicks two weeks ago. <laughs> you don't know how to pronounce their players' names. Dan, <laughs> I don't want to alarm you, but Shohei Otani has played three spring training games and is batting over 700. <laughs> the top of their lineup is Mookie Betts, Otani, and Freddie Freeman. Four MVPs between three hitters. <laughs> how did Rob Manfred allow this? That's crazy. Atlanta's better. <laughs> Are they? They have Chris Sale, apparently, I just saw. What? Braves have Chris Sale. No way. Yep. He's still around, huh? It's a bad contract. Good for him, Red though. That sucks. Really? Yeah, he t you know, had an injury in Boston. Mm -hmm. Get him out there. Xavier Worthy broke the 40-yard dash record running a 4-2-1 at the combine. Fast. That's all I got. <laughs> Really? That's excellent analysis. <laughs> my not wrong. He's, That's, fat. he's yeah. not wrong, but yeah. it's, uh, it is the most obvious of the observations. The mm. guy who ran the fastest time in the history of the combine is fast. It's not a great observation. I'm not hearing a lot of it today, though. Right. Just that simple. I'm also saying it. Matt Rempe. Everybody. Recently yeah. made his more, NHL debut. More people debut. that are talking about J.J. Watt playing hockey. I mean, they're giving more. Should be talking. They're giving more, though. Like No one's just being like fast. Yep. Matt Rempe. Recently made his NHL debut for the Rangers and already has five fights in his last seven games. He has spent more time in the penalty box than on the ice. That's what being an enforcer is all about. Goon. Hockey player. In honor of the great Chris Mortensen, 
the Chris Mortensen Top 5 Information Guys in Sports Media History. Wow. OLI, John Clayton, the Professor. Number 5, Jay Glazer. Number 4, Adam Schefter. Number 3, Peter Gammons. Number two, the Miami bouncer that called in, told me and Dan that Shaq was getting traded to the Suns. We dismissed him. I saw him Friday. Five minutes later, Shaq was traded to the Suns. The Shaq bouncer? or the guy? You saw the bouncer? He, he wasn't a bouncer. He's the, dare, he's the dare t-shirt guy. Oh. I saw him Friday. He introduced himself the after dare all Dare t-shirt guy? Like drugs there? Huh. Like he invented the Dare T-shirt? No, or he, he was wearing the day the day that he broke the story, the single greatest story this show has ever broken because we haven't had a bigger one unless it's my engagement. A betrayal <laughs> my by, dad, by yeah. Greg got that one. Cody, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's the biggest story we've ever had. That guy broke the story that Shaq had been traded to the Heat, <laughs> and we laughed at him and dismissed him. What does he do now? Where'd you see him? I saw him at uh, Feast with the Beasts Ooh. at the zoo. Oh, yeah. wow. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was there. I didn't see you. Okay. Dan was in VIP. I was there with the Dare T-shirt guy. We were in VIP. By design. Though. Being served beans. <laughs> Roy, you remember that as a bouncer, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was he ever a bouncer? I don't think he was ever a bouncer. Always a T-shirt guy. <laughs> no, maybe he Dare was T-shirt. Did he sell T-shirts or maybe, just no? Wearing he was wearing the one. He was. He wearing didn't one. invent it though. He did not invent the Dare T-shirt. No. Huh. huh. I he have did. one of those. Those mm. Dare shirts. I think I got it in elementary school. It yeah. finally Man. fits me. Yeah. Did it work? Oh. oh. <laughs> not really. We laughed at T-shirt guy off the radio, me and you. That's right. <laughs> Number one. He'll Mort. be happy to know we're talking <laughs> about him again. Do you think the percentage of kids that wore Dare T-shirts, like there's a higher percentage of kids that did drugs or didn't do drugs? Did. Did. It's my, it's my weed smoking shirt. Is it? The no. kids that, the you kids have that wear them now shirt? wear it ironically <laughs> to do drugs in. All my shirts are. <laughs> in the entire closet. Smoke weed in all of them. More. Hopefully, I'll see you in heaven. Coin toss for me. One person I can assure you, you won't be seeing, is a certain former Baylor head football coach. Because he's going straight to hell. Speaking of hell, Arp Riles. Dan, those are the weekend observations. You have it as a coin toss that you're going to hell? Yeah. <laughs> 50-50. <laughs> We will bring in Jamel Hill in a second, but our Iowa correspondent, who's not even working today, is insisting on coming in here and cheerleading. I think she might have some objections to some of the opinions you've had today. I heard heard you during the break saying we have not reached equality until I can say Caitlin Clark's a choker uh, for not winning a championship. (laughs) Am I wrong? Uh, uh, So, uh, Lucy, that's right. That's where he started. That's where he started today. Uh, We will get to Jamel in a second, but do we have have imaging we've got imaging what do you think well he told me he had imaging lucy rodine iowa correspondent have at it lucy uh tell us every all of your thoughts from yesterday Yesterday was maybe my favorite moment of like my all time Iowa fandom. And I know you're thinking, Lucy, you're an Iowa fan. There aren't that many moments. And that might be true. But yesterday was still so high on the list. Just when it started off college game day, you see the crowd. They all have their women's basketball lives here at church. You're like, oh, my God. Maya Moore comes out. Caitlin Clark screams. It was the best moment of my entire life. She was so happy. She was so pure. Then for her to go out, break the all-time NCAA scoring record. All-time. I know there's conversations about NIAIA, NAIA and D2 scores that have scored more than Caitlin. That's, that's not the point of this right now. The point is that Caitlin Clark came in. They beat the crap out of Ohio State. I feel like the score was closer than it actually actually was if Iowa plays like that if Hannah Stolke plays like that if we see Sydney Folter keep that going Iowa will win the national championship we're gonna win a te- we're gonna win a- Stu you won't be able to say that anymore because we're gonna win I hope I never have to say it again to be honest with you a Man. technical a technical free throw is not the way to do that well she was a little <laughs> off in the first half it I, she was trying to do a little too much. Caitlin, she got a little yippy. You saw this ahead of the Kelsey Plum, Plum record. You could see that Caitlin was kind of in her head about it. Once, I didn't like the technical free throw, and I also don't think that should have been a technical. However, it doesn't matter. 
doesn't it who cares iowa won she went off had a great game not even her best i was like oh she's not, she probably left 15 out there still at over 30 how that's you, my girl i'm so proud of her how you do it absolutely matters i'm with dan on this i would have missed the tech i would have I mean, you would have missed well, it on get purpose. in a more traditional way flashy way yeah. oh bull yeah. get out of here <laughs> I think it works because she broke Kelsey Plum's record on that, like, insane logo three. She already had that moment. And I hope that Caitlin said, I don't care about the record. I just care about getting the win. And that's why she made her free throws, because she's a team player. How hard was it for Travis Scott to get to that game physically between snow, airports, and travel? Well, I don't know if you've heard about global warming, so it was 60 degrees there. So it was lovely. <laughs> he was able to get there quite easily. Iowa actually has an airport very close by that's not, like, impossible to fly into. So he probably had a little private jet land in the Cedar Rapids or Iowa City Airport. He came or in. Or Indianapolis. Or not Indianapolis. Oh, <laughs> damn. It's just seven Dan's hours bad. away. It's seven <laughs> hours away. They also, by the way, ESPN like four times called Iowa, Iowa State, and put up Iowa State graphics. That pissed me off. That was not cool. <laughs> what other thoughts do you have before we uh, give the floor over to Jamel? We just wanted to get you to celebrate for a few minutes. This is such a cool moment. And as an Iowa fan, as a diehard Kaylin Clark fan, like just – Take it in. Enjoy it. I've been watching her for four years at Iowa. I remember when she committed to Iowa. It still doesn't, like, I'm not used to it. Every time she shoots one of those crazy logo threes, I'm like, why are you doing that? Every single time that I see her vision, I'm like, this is, we're watching one of the greatest to ever do it. We should just enjoy it. We should be there. We should live in the moment. And you know what? Hannah Stolke, shout out to you. You don't get the praise you deserve, and Iowa will win the national championship if she can continue this. It's all about Hannah. Oh, and look, I got Lucy Rodine, Iowa correspondent. Uh, thank you, Lucy. We appreciate the time. We will not read any of uh, the criticisms that say there's no three-point line or shot clock when Pete played and he used a larger basketball. But How was that Caitlin's fault? What does that have to do with her? <laughs> um, what I is ran... she supposed to do about that? I ran the math really quick. It looks like at 19.9 uh, three-point line, Pete would have shot 13 three-pointers a game and averaged 57 points per game. Okay, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Get out of here. He did that outside he the imaging. <laughs> Get out of here. Right. Uh, Lucy, good talking to you. Thank you. We'll see you later well this done. week. Iowa's going to win the natty. Everybody write it down. <laughs> Put money on it. Lucy Rodine, Iowa correspondent. Yeah, you mentioned that. Thank you. Uh, Jamel, uh, what are your thoughts here? Because it is quite the phenomenon. You... It, it, it is a fairly you're, you've spent a lifetime covering sports. We haven't seen anything like this before. No, we haven't. But let me just say real quick. God bless you, Lucy. God bless you. I, <laughs> don't let this industry take this unbridled enthusiasm that you feel right now. How you feel right now witnessing this as a student journalist. Like, keep this feeling with you forever because they will try to destroy it. They will try to beat you down. Keep it, Lucy. Keep it. Anyway. <laughs> no, you're Just so right. No, the, the, well, she's the, wrong. No. She's not a student journalist. No, she's a professional. But I she's mean. got the enthusiasm. Oh, she's oh, got. Wait, the I thought she was. I thought she was a student journalist. I'm so sorry, Lucy. I didn't mean to disrespect your resume. I'm an My ass. Bad. Uh, she graduated. It might have been the imaging. <laughs> she graduated. Okay, I thought she was a student. Journalist. She, 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 no, but she has the enthusiasm of a student journalist, and you are right as a grizzled veteran to to notice that the business will eat her up and chew her out. She will not sound like that 15 years from now oh, just dealing with kidding? us yeah no I, no she, she she won't sound like that at all in fact she will sound just how i'm about to sound right now in about two seconds when you guys cue the neighborhood friendly race lady music i will sound <laughs> just like it will sound 15 years your from now. friendly neighborhood race lady <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet, though. We're not going. I'm worried how she's going to sound next year without Caitlin Clark on her team, to be perfectly honest with you. Because <laughs> then she's just going back to rooting for Iowa. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but what did you make of everything you saw, uh, Jamel, yesterday? Because, uh, like I'm saying, I even as I watch this growth and I talk about some of the things that we've talked about, which is like that regular season college basketball ratings are better than regular season NBA ratings. Uh, Caitlin Clark is at the front of a movement that I never expected to see flourish in a place like Iowa. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just really incredible to watch all these new fans coming to the game. The fact that 
Caitlin has created her own economy. And this is the moment, I think, in women's sports. Um, but let's just say women's basketball, because we've seen, obviously, with women's soccer, we've seen some other very important seminal moments in other women's sports. But for women's basketball, this really feels like their time. I mean, it's been an escalating movement. Ratings the last five years have been really incredible, both at the college level and at the WNBA level. And now there is somebody else, um, uh, maybe a bigger phenomenon than we've seen maybe in maybe 15 or 20 years, somebody that is going to transition to the WNBA and bring hopefully all of this enthusiasm, these fans, all of this with her. Um, it felt, I, I said this last uh, year when um, uh, Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark obviously scored off uh, in, in the women's um, final four, is that this very much feels like this could potentially be the Larry Bird, Magic Johnson kind of moment, if you will, in the sense of that something that was so special at the college level transferred over to the professional level and it changed the NBA forever. Have you given any thought uh, as all of the streaming services fight for sports content and these are undervalued rights properties, what this is going to end up going for when this stuff sells for what it's worth? Yeah, it's grossly, it, it's a it's a huge bargain right now, I think, women's sports, especially women's basketball, if you think about it. And all I ask people to do as they're constantly ramming the women's game up against where the men's game is in its current form is to look at the same measure of time of when women's or when men's sports started to take off, like how long that took. It usually took, you know, two, three, sometimes four decades for it to really solidify and come together. And I think this is what you're starting to see the evolution of now, all the hard work, um, the fact that a lot of these women have been in this game and been committed to this game when there wasn't the type of payoff that you're seeing Caitlin Clark uh, have now. You know, there was something, even though this was a great moment, Dan, I have to be honest, there was some, there was one small bit of it that was sad. And this is where the conversation takes a turn. I saw something that Lynette Woodard said. Now, Lynette Woodard, um, one of the greatest players in, in women's history. And when she played in college, it was still under the AIAW, which was the governing body for women's sports before the NCAA began to include women's sports. So quick history lesson, everybody. Not until the early 80s did the NCAA actually include women's sports. So they had their own separate governing body, of which Lynette Woodard had the record for a large school, uh, the scoring record for a large school. And she said that, if it wasn't for Caitlin Clark, people wouldn't remember her. And that made me really sad. And because the unfortunate downside, if you want to call it that, to Caitlin Clark's success, she's so great. She deserves all this attention. The Nike ad was phenomenal. But it also makes you understand the erasure that has happened in this game. And Lynette Woodard, again, I said she holds the large school scoring record. Pearl uh, Moore actually holds the lower school scoring record for the AI uh, AW, which was 4,061 points. None of these scoring records are included with the NCAA. And that's the shame of it is that they didn't transfer over the scoring records. And I'm not saying that that diminishes in any way what kind of player and what kind of performer and what kind of talent that Caitlin Clark is. But when people are talking about who she's doing this on the shoulders of, a lot of it is Black women who, frankly, legacies have been erased. And so I hope this is an opportunity, a teachable opportunity for people to understand the people that came before them. And so when you hear someone, I know she got into a lot of trouble, but when you hear Cheryl Swoops talking about and trying to contextualize what Caitlin Clark has done, she's probably thinking not only about herself, but all these other women who have come before her that have had their legacies pushed aside and erased because that's just in many ways, how sports fans are programmed to do when it comes to women's sports. So I hope this is a good opportunity for people to learn more about the great players that have preceded this moment. I don't know if that, like, I, I hope the same thing, but I don't know if that's happening at all because the, I think the coverage of women's college basketball this season has completely ignored the fact that South Carolina just had their second back-to-back -back undefeated season. They haven't lost at home in, like, three or four years, Damn. and they're the best team in the country right now, ranked number one, undefeated, 27-0. and 0. 
haven't lost an SEC regular game in years. And, and like, I feel like they're getting no national attention. And, and I think part of it has to do with the fact that we, as an entire, like, sports media industry, don't cover women's sports very well to begin with. And also the jobs keep shrinking more and more, too. But I'm wondering, Jamel, how you feel about that and the fact that, like, it feels like, yes, we're talking about women's basketball more, but it's, it's mostly just Caitlin Clark in Iowa. Well, if you recall, and I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, if you recall a couple years ago, Paige Beckers, the obviously outstanding player for UConn, she gave her SB speech because I think she was awarded Female Athlete of the Year. During her speech, she made a point to recognize the fact that uh, the entire sport and even the sport in the moment of where it was in that particular time was a sport that was built off the contributions and the effort and the commitment of Black women. That's not to diminish what white women have done. I have had these conversations with Um, with black women who have played basketball, who currently play basketball and with some who have, who coach basketball uh, and they don't begrudge. And I I don't want to collectively speak for all of them, but one thing that we have certainly talked about in, in, in the last few years is how there are certain machines that get behind certain players and not others. Like you wouldn't know looking in many ways at women's basketball to know that Aja Wilson is probably the best player in the world. And you probably wouldn't know that. And you look at our success, you can now add a New York Times bestselling author to it. And, but these machines, I I mean, I I have to be honest, a lot of times, not saying it's strictly the time, a lot of times they do follow, uh, you know, white players. And there is this worry and this concern that a lot of the phenomenon is being built specifically around certain faces for certain reasons. And so that's why Paige Becker's, her speech a couple years ago was very meaningful and it meant a lot um, to a lot of the players who are playing in the game who see this kind of happen. And I get it with Caitlin Clark. I mean, living in Iowa, playing for um, a university that traditionally has not had some of the other success. It's an underdog story. It's a middle America story. And she is playing the game in a way we have never seen a woman play the game that represents where we are in the modern form of basketball. She's Steph Curry in so many ways. And while there is this phenomenon there and swirling and bubbling and creating this tornado of events, I think it is very, I don't think it diminishes or takes away from her success at all to say, wait a minute, how did we get here? And what does this really mean? Uh, Not just for Caitlin Clark, but for all players. When you mentioned the history, though, you mentioned Magic and Larry, and Larry's whiteness helped all of that become what it was. Like those games were on tape delay before those finals games were on tape delay before we had a white guy and a black guy fighting for stardom, right? Because what Jessica's mentioning is true, but it's so much in that sport. We we gravitate toward the stars more than the teams. Yeah, I mean, and you're right, Dan. I mean, that was part of what it was. It's like you had white guy from Indiana um, against a black guy from from Michigan. And even though Lansing is the capital of Michigan, but it is a, a smallish town, maybe not as small as where Larry Bird grew up. But the reality is that those optics were helpful in growing the game. And even though there was that earned a current of race that was forever there, uh, it did help grow it. And we saw how strong that undercurrent of race was between Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. And frankly, even with Cheryl Swoops, and, and and don't get me wrong, I understand that there was factually some things that Cheryl Swoops got wrong in characterizing her game. And later on, you know, those things were corrected in that same podcast. But, you know, Cheryl Swoops talked about the fact that she was called a racist for critically analyzing her game. And if anybody could analyze her game, you would think Cheryl Swoops would be qualified so that bubbling, uh, that undercurrent is there. Because even when I bring up Caitlin Clark, it's like, and we've seen this so many, so much in sports before, Dan and Stu, is that if you don't call them the greatest thing you've ever seen, if you don't say, hey, this is the most exciting women's player ever, this is the best women's player ever, that you're somehow being a hater. And if you're Black and saying it, somehow you're being a racist toward Caitlin Clark. And it's like, no, I've just watched 30 plus years of women's basketball. And I will say she's one of the best college players in history she is definitely the most exciting women's player in the game right now but the extra platitudes turns this conversation into something it's not supposed to be we're supposed to all feel like uh lucy right now but there's always these other things and uh you know unfortunately when you become a grizzled veteran you can't unsee some of these things it's true it's like you want uh, like i i think the Caitlin Clark conversation should happen, but also it would be great if the rest of the sport got some coverage, at least like a little bit. I feel like it's this season has been so focused on it, which then, like you said, it adds to this feeling of like, 
you don't want to take anything away from it, but you wish there was just more. Like, I wish there was just yeah. more of it nationally. And you could tell in the analysis, too. And that that's another part where it's clear that there needs to be some growth in this in this game is that you're having a lot of people chime in who have not watched beyond maybe Caitlin Clark and Iowa behind maybe the last couple of years. And so you also see sort of this vast hole in terms of who is talking about women's sports. Certainly there's a lot of incredible female analysts, but Caitlin Clark, her success hasn't gotten a lot of them positioned to talk about Caitlin Clark, even though they've been talking about women's basketball for a long time. People are by default looking at the men to contextualize what is happening. I mean, God bless Shaq. I know, you know, when he said that she was the best women's player in history and I'm like, dude, I mean, Cheryl Miller's still here, right? Like, what are, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that those conversations shouldn't be had, but that's what's happening is that people are going to Shaq. They're going to, you know, men who certainly watch the game, but the women's game, while all still basketball, it's a different game. And I think we need more people uh, to be able to analyze this game uh, properly who are women who have been doing this for a long time. That was your friendly neighborhood race lady. Was there any moment for you cooler yesterday than the way Caitlin Clark squealed when she saw the pioneer? She saw Maya Moore. I don't know if she thinks she's better than Maya Moore, but she saw Maya Moore (laughs) and was delighted by it. Yeah, that was an amazing moment. And that's about, um, you know, this torch that has passed. I mean, you know, you think about Maya Moore's age and and why she left the game. Maya Moore should be playing right now. Uh, But I thought that was great to see and great to see Caitlin acknowledge somebody who's been obviously a tremendous influence on, on her career. And again, this, this offers a a entry path and an entryway for those who are just now discovering women's basketball because of Caitlin Clark. I don't begrudge you. I'm not going to do you how sometimes soccer fans will do uh, new fans that come to their sport and just totally haze them the entire time. Welcome. And I'm glad you're here, but while you're here, Make sure that you look through those archives to see some of the women who have done it before. (laughs) See you later, Jamel. Good talking to you. All right. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Today's stat of the day is brought to you by Venmo and PayPal. I feel like you got to wait until my dad is done. He laughs I, mean, I literally dude. just told him that. What are you worried about? What's the it's matter with you? It's a lot of laughing, time, Poppy. Dude. What's the rush? Where are we, go, where go, are we going? Bobby. Where do you have to be? Tradition. Go ahead, little father. Eh? Billy, this stat of the day is for you. Cameron Mabin. Ooh. <laughs> former. It's a name that just makes you laugh. I mean. Former Marlin. Uh, has hit home runs in three different decades for the Tigers. All the more amazing because he only played 132 games for the Tigers. <laughs> wow. That is that's a riddle. Like that is that is hard to <laughs> Roy fell Can out. Can you say of, it again? Roy <laughs> fell out of his chair uh, because you weren't listening. Well, I, we're all confused a bit. Jess had the same look I had. No, he played for the Tigers uh, three different times in three different decades, right? Okay. Yes. Well, or he played for them two times at the turnover of one of the decades. <laughs> like, he was still on the team. Carry like, over. In two yeah. th- like, in whatever, 1999. I don't know. No, that's not how it happened. Is it three, is it three different <laughs> Tigers? 2000, 2007, 2016, and 2020. Is this kind of Tigers. Is this kind of like that thing where you can stand in four states at one time? <laughs> no. The four corners? Illinois, Indiana. It's just like you just Iowa. happen to be in the right spot, Those okay? It's not a cool corners. stat. It's just... I think you have the quad I think all I states touch, if I'm not mis- mistaken. Let's not go to Dan on this. Idaho what, doesn't touch. What are the four states that you can stand in at uh, time? Uh, I think <laughs> Utah, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, Arizona, Arizona New Mexico? Mexico? I think something like that. Sounds right. I wonder, if, any, I wonder if anyone's ever had sex in all four states. I wonder, states I wonder if the internet would provide an answer as opposed to just trying to do it off the top of your, your head. Your guess was correct. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> so many geography <laughs> problems on this show. Dan, we had an idea during the break. 
I don't know if we're going to do it or not because it puts you in a bad spot. But we were thinking maybe you look at this blank map and tell us which states are which in the Midwest. No, oh, I'm not doing that. Oh, come I'm, on. I, I'm not going to take a quiz. <laughs> Oh, okay. I don't. My, I'm terrible at geography. I am. I am really. Okay, bad just at tell it. us which one's Iowa. The, the, then. the world's geography. It's one of those in the middle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Des Moines yeah. is the capital. Nailed it. That's all I know. Oh, you know the capital. That's okay, all I great. got. I don't have the capitals. I'm okay on, but geography in general. So, Tony, show terrible. me where Iowa and Indiana touch. Hello. You asking me? Hey, yo. No. <laughs> Look here. Here's the thing. Indiana. So Michigan is obviously the glove, right? And stands over to the other side. The glove. Indiana is right underneath that. <laughs> Illinois to the left of that. Right. Mm hmm. Yep. Ohio's to the right of that. Mm -hmm. Underneath Ohio's West Virginia. To the up of that is Pennsylvania. All right, we got York. it. Yeah, we I, you guys are getting the wrong yeah. guy. I don't dude. know why you guys are doing this. Iowa Please. and Indiana don't touch two gods. Please huh. stop doing this. Please stop okay. doing it now. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't think this is good for the audio <laughs> so audience. Just looking <laughs> at a map. No. Bit canceled. Yeah, no, if we do it, if we do the bit, it should be a big map behind Dan so Tony can do it so we can all see. The way yeah. we were doing it was wrong. That's producing right there. I I don't want to do geography quizzes as a visual aid uh, when I am trying mostly to do an audio show. I don't think this is good in any of the environments that we could pump it out into America. So it's just okay. bad for audio, not because you. Don't I just know think it's the, all bad. Excuses. I, I oh. don't. I, I don't think that people want to see me looking and trying to guess places on a map when I'm telling you on the front end I'm not good at that. So you admit they're good. That's why they want to see it. What do you have me admitting? <laughs> That their guesses, you don't actually know. Okay. I feel like I'm flying a little too close. I'll put myself at the penalty box. Oh, whoa! Wow. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Cameron Maven was on a lot of teams, huh? Yeah. Like every other season, he was on a new team. It's because he wasn't good. That's part of it. <laughs> well, I mean, can you say someone's not good if they were in the major leagues for 14 years? That's a fair question to ask. Ooh, I like this. Who's it's, the worst player to have a long career Maven. in MLB history? Huh. No, we've got to find worse than, than Maven. I remember we talked about it one time with Emilio Bonifacio saying he wasn't oh. good, and then we looked it up and it was like, he was in the majors for like 14 seasons also. Hmm. I, I feel like in Major League Baseball, you got to be just good enough. Because if you're looking for like that bench player or whatever, it's right. like, oh, he was on the Cubs last year? Yeah, we'll, got, we'll give him a shot. Just good enough to stick around. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Billy wants very badly to be someone who's good enough to be by name in a video game of some <laughs> sort. Sort of. I want to be a scab player for the, the college football game. Because there's this discussion over NIL whether you should be playing college football players, how much should you be paying them, and who's going to hold out or the good players going to hold out. Because $600 yeah. doesn't Nothing. seem like a lot of money, yeah. right? And I'm here to say, look, if Caleb Williams doesn't want to be the quarterback for USC... Billy Gilt will be. Like, I am here. You can use my name, image, and likeness for a fee, a smaller fee. Right. But you can Small use it, and I'm happy to be there to be one of these star football players that doesn't want to be in the video game. More than happy to be that player. I'll go with Billy if I can get an advanced copy of the game so I get it before everybody else. You can keep the money. Just give me the game early. Hmm. I think I found the worst baseball player in sports in baseball you, wait, history. The worst hitter with a long career, Bill Bergen, a catcher. He had over 3,200 plate appearances, 170 average, two career home runs, just a negative 14.85 war. This is going to be tough to beat. Old Bill Bergen. Bergy. How long did he play for? It'll be a backup catcher of some sort. I'm thinking that about 11 Ron, seasons. Like Ron played. Hodges. It's going to be, I think, a back. you'll find an assortment of backup catchers. You have to understand, the backup catcher exists just because it's really hard to catch in the heat every day, and then you play six games in a row. And on Sunday, he doesn't want to get up on Sunday morning and catch another Major League Baseball game. He so struck out 354 more times in his career than he had extra base hits. Hmm. But his debut was 1901. None of that counts. Yeah. Like, yeah. 1901 to 1911 doesn't count for this game. Anyone born in the 1800s. I went out to go to the penalty box, and everyone out there right now is trying to put states in a blank map and figure out which state is which. It's and let hard. me tell you, it is bleak. <laughs> Are you good at geography? Is this a strength of yours? Yes. Name 15 states. No, Tony. I just named 15 states on the blank map. Oh, I yeah. thought you were like, you know geography, name 15 states. Do it. <laughs> Do you have a list of the right. states or no? Because if you in have the list, mind, then yeah. it's easy in to do. Mind, if you don't have the list, it's harder because you'll forget the name you of the state. You can just picture a map in your head. Is that what everyone does? Hmm. No. Hmm. I mean, you guys 
cut. Burgie. <laughs> I'm very happy that we've got this guy, Stugatz. This guy is what March Madness is all about. That's right. right He's the yeah. sophomore center for the Indiana State uh, Indiana State Sycamores. Uh, they are leading the Missouri Valley Conference. We hope to see him in the tournament later this month because of this guy. Robbie Avila is, uh, I pronounce that with a Latin flourish. Are you Hispanic? Do you have Hispanic uh, origin? I do, yeah. Uh, my my dad is Mexican. His dad was from Mexico, so uh, I'm half Mexican, yeah. I was uh, very happy to learn of you this weekend, and I learned of you because I'd never heard the nickname Cream Abdul Jabbar. I believe it to be the greatest <laughs> nickname I've ever heard for a player. Uh, what is the history of this? Have you heard it before? Did you realize that you were going viral all weekend because people were discovering you? Uh, yeah, no, ever since I started, you know, uh, blowing up a little bit on social media is, you know, you put the goggles to, to what Kareem had and, you know, it's kind of, it's been a lot of fun. You know, I've gotten a couple of nicknames. I've Larry nerd was one of them. Kareem of uh, <laughs> step blurry. And so it's been a bunch of uh, fun nicknames that I've seen all over social media, wow. but, uh, yeah, no, it's just, been, it's just been a good time. Uh, can you tell us about your rise and your story? How often do you get underestimated because of the goggles? Uh, yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, not a conventional look, you know, for a basketball player, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of just something you don't see too often anymore. And so, like you said, I, I get underestimated a little bit. You know, I shock guys with, with how I play on the court. But uh, I don't really let that affect me. I kind of just go ahead and, you know, play my game no matter what. Um, I'm just going to just kind of let my game do the talking. You know, if you want to underestimate me, then I, I wish you luck. And that's all I got to, uh, got to say for y'all. That, that's it. Is there a story behind the goggles? Is there a reason you're wearing goggles? Uh, so it's really just all a vision thing. Originally, I started playing football when I was younger and um, I couldn't wear glasses. They would have broke instantly. And so uh, my mom invested in a pair of goggles. And so I kind of just started wearing that ever since. You know, once I started playing basketball, I just kept wearing that. And uh, in high school, uh, I thought about going to contacts. And so I tried them out real quick, but I couldn't really, you know, get it down. And then my brother came to me. He told me, he's like, hey. You know, you're not you without your goggles, and so you can't get contacts. And so that's kind of how I just kind of stuck with him, you know. And so he kind of helped me, you know, it's kind of part of my brand now. And so that's just really how I'm going to start wearing the goggles and I'm going to continue to wear them. Which of the nicknames do you like best? Which is your favorite? See, my personal favorite, uh, my favorite uh, music artist is Rob Wave. And so uh, I got one earlier in the year, Rob Wade. And so that, that's always going to be my favorite. But I do like the Kareem of the too. Uh, can you tell us, because one of the reasons I imagine that you get underestimated is it's a, it's a Jokic-type game, right? It's a little bit, uh, it's a mm -hmm. little, you know, we don't expect it to be high above the rim. And so when you can do things that don't seem like they're as fast as others, but you're going 23 points on 80% shooting, 35 points, 8 boards, 5 assists, 20 two points on 66 percent shooting 15 points 30 points those are your last five games you're averaging 25 points a game obviously you're a menace <laughs> yeah no uh, obviously i think everybody knows I, I i'm not the quickest guy or i don't jump the highest but i think uh being able to use my uh, skills and my uh, basketball iq uh just being able to see the game and, and, and read it in different ways that some other people that can't do it like that. Uh, I think it kind of makes up for my, my lack of athleticism. So uh, being able to play the game at my own pace, you know, not letting guys speed me up or, uh, you know, being under pressure, just kind of, you know, doing it myself, you know, the calm, you know, pace that I do it at, I think kind of helps me, you know, uh, you know, attack defenses, you know, with guys that are quicker or jump higher than me. What kind of offers did you have coming out of high school? How much of uh, how much of this afflicted even the people offering scholarships because they didn't see in you perhaps what you saw in you? Uh, yeah, a lot of my looks out of uh, high school came from uh, a lot of the Missouri Valley teams, uh, Northern Iowa, Southern Illinois. Uh, I had a couple. I had a couple other looks at. Uh, they were the high major, but I don't think they. I think, like I said, uh, the athleticism may have thrown them off a little bit to the, where they didn't pull the trigger to offer. But uh, you know, getting recruited by Indiana State, you know, uh, they so they saw past the, the athleticism. They they saw the the, the the extremely skills that I had and the IQ that I obtained, and so that kind of you know jumped at me and you know, allowed me to be able to uh, 
you know, do everything that I can here, you know, being able to use all my skills, you know, being able to shoot, pass, and, and dribble. And then, uh, you know, being able to play under Coach Church, you know, is something that I just couldn't pass up on. Robbie, you're an Illinois kid playing in Indiana. I was an Illinois kid that went to school in Indiana also. We love the Midwest around here. Which I state in the Midwest is the superior state, Illinois or Indiana? A hundred percent Illinois. Uh, well, my, my roommate is a, a Indiana high school kid, and so uh, we have debates back and forth about which is better, high school ball or AAU ball in Illinois and Indiana. So we have that debate all the time, but I'm going to stick to Illinois no matter what. Is it accurate, your listed height and weight, 6'10", 240? Uh, yeah, I'm about 6'10", 245, 250. Uh, do you run into a lot of people that feel physically stronger than you when you're playing? Uh, there's a couple guys, yeah, that are uh, some bigger dudes, you know, real strong. You know, they're you know, uh, two years older than me, but uh, I think I hold myself, uh, hold my own down there in the, in the post this year. You know, something I worked on over the summer. Uh, last year as a freshman, I kind of struggled down there, but I think uh, I've taken steps. You know, I'm not, you know, 100% at my best down there in the post defense, but uh, I think I definitely have, uh, you know, made progress towards getting stronger down there. Portillo's or Culver's? That's a tough one. Uh, I think, I think because I get it less, I would have to say Portillo's, but uh, I'm a big fan of cheese, so I love uh, Culver's cheese curds. What's your Portillo's order? Uh, like I said, I'm a lover of cheese, so I, I usually get a, a cheese dog with a, a, a large fry and, and a strawberry shake. That's usually my my, my portillo. That's, that's a good that's a good order. You're not uh, <laughs> you're not winning a lot of foot races out there, correct? On your team? Oh, oh when, yeah, no. Uh, so so how how does that one go? Like when we're running slow, when we're running suicides, <laughs> is there uh, are you the slowest on the team? Are you are you being are you lagging behind? Uh, I'm one of the guys in the past. I won't say I'm that uh, always the last guy, but uh, I'm, I'm definitely not uh, up there in the first, second, or third. I'll tell you that. Can you tell us uh, when did you become good at basketball? Like when is it along the path that you knew this was the path for you? Um, ever since growing up, uh, I, I watched NBA players. You know, I watched Kevin Durant being a, a seven foot guard. You know, watch other guys. You know, play play. You know, Kevin Love, another big guy that can shoot. You know. I watched them, and so ever since growing up, you know, I knew I wanted to play basketball. And, you know, over time, I think it would be probably around eighth grade, I started to realize uh, that, you know, I was actually pretty good at it. You know, I wasn't just taller than everybody at that time. I was actually, you know, you know, a, a solid player. And so over high school, I kind of uh, just really dug into it and started working hard, you know, hitting the weight room, you know, doing workouts, you know, you know, five days a week. And so kind of just really started there and, you uh, I'd say after my you know sophomore year, I had a pretty good year. We, uh, me and my teammate right now, Jason Kent, you know, we had a really good year at Old Forest, and so that kind of started a little bit of the buzz of you know going to college and playing there. And so that that kind of is really when I, I started to realize that you know hey, I, I could play at the college level. You know I could do that. You know it's just been a process ever since, and you know I'm just uh, enjoying the journey and uh, looking forward to to what's next here. Were you good from the beginning or just tall at the beginning? Uh, I would say when I was younger, I was like a foot and a half taller than everybody else. But uh, I think I still had those type of skills. You know, my uh, when I was in second grade, my brother was playing with his fourth grade team and uh, I was able to practice and my dad was a coach. And so I got to practice with them all the time. And, you know, being being two years younger, the guy was really shocking because I was the only guy out there that was able to make a left handed layup. And, you know, with younger kids like that. So the, the skills have kind of been, you know, ever since I was little, and it was just really just polishing them and getting them better and better, you know, as I grew up. It can be awkward to be the kid who's different from the other kids. I would imagine that sports allowed you, uh, gave you a great deal of confidence in some places that it can be hard to come by, being good at basketball. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously the, the goggles, uh, you know, throws people off, you know, even in their regular day life too, you know, it's just not something you see. And so... Uh, when I was in uh, eighth grade, uh, I kept breaking my actual glasses. And so my mom stopped paying for regular glasses and maybe wore the, the goggles just as everyday pair of glasses. So, you know, you know, you get teased here and there, you know, it bothered me a little bit when I was younger. But, you know, it's just, you know, something that comes with it. And I think sports allowed me to be able to to kind of feel a little bit more normal, you know, being able to to do whatever I want out there, you know, have success out there. It definitely kind of took away from, you know, the little teasing here and there when I was uh, when I was younger. Because you were beating people up, that's why. Because you were scoring. Because <laughs> you were scoring thirty a game with your left hand. Oh yeah, yes sir.
<laughs> we going pro next year? What are you thinking? What's happening? Uh, I haven't decided none of that just yet. I'm ready. I'm focused on winning more championships here. All right. Uh, uh, very good. Do you have uh, Do you have a top five list for him, Stugatz? Top five uh, what? Be, be goggled athletes of all time? I do have a top five. I think Tony has one as well, right? Uh, I, both of you have yeah. a top five? I've got five? a basketball specific top five. Yeah. His is athletes Ooh, of all competing. time. Yes. All right. Yes. Let's, uh, let's, ha- let's have yours first, Tony, and let's have uh, let's have Robbie check this out and see whether he agrees or disagrees. Uh, well, we'll check in with you at the end of this robbie number five tom uh, number five see. robbie avila oh wow all right congratulations Pandering. i mean uh, he's he's big smoothie down there that's the thing that's what you don't get dan when you're watching his highlights he's euro stepping he's moving in a way that that smaller dish guys in the move. rock dish in the rock respectfully how many of his highlights did you see before this weekend mm-hmm. a ton he's he's been good for the last two years billy yeah, yeah. jeez number four uh. james worthy Big game, James. Big game, James, yeah. Good of Billy to always be there for you, Tony. Number three. <laughs> he doesn't watch basketball. Real Hoopers know he does not watch basketball whatsoever. Number three, Amari Sotomar stat. Now, he wore the Oakleys, which I still put in the goggle category, but he right. revolutionized. Like, when he put the Oakleys on, game over. Number two. Number two, Hakeem the Dream. Number one. For a short time. Yeah. He could never be number one because Double number coffee. one, yeah. the GOAT. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, no, no Kirk Rambis on there. How's that list? Wow. Uh, how's that list overall for you, Robbie? Anything uh, that needs to go in it? Anything that needs to get taken out? Yeah, that's a that's a pretty solid list there. You know, you can't argue. I think maybe maybe I would switch James Worthy and Stoudemire. <laughs> Not you though. Not you. No, I can't argue. No, I gotta say, <laughs> I'm nowhere, I'm he nowhere revolutionized the game yeah. though with the Oakleys. If you were Oakleys, I might have to drop you down too. Maybe two, three. Who knows? Uh, I appreciate that, but I, we'll, we'll see where, where it comes in the future. Stugatz, are you ready for your top five? I am ready, yes. And this is just athletes. Please. Athletes all time, yep. Number five. Michael Phelps. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. Eric Dickerson. That's a good list. That's good. Number, <laughs> number three. Katie Ledecky. <laughs> Number two. Robbie. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Changed it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and number one. Chris Sabo. <laughs> good list. Good list. It good is. list. It's a good list. It's a good list. Uh, Robbie, thank you for being on with us. We appreciate it, sir. No, thank you guys for having us. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Robbie. Steph Blurry is fun. <laughs> I read recently, Stugatz, that Walmart has, I believe the number was, can you guys look this up for me because I don't actually want to get it wrong, but has about 2 or $3 billion a year sort of set aside for the idea that people are going to steal things and there's going to be all manner of credit card fraud when it comes to the purchasing of Ooh. things. The number was a number so high that I was startled by it. And I got to thinking about it the other day because uh, all around my street, because Jeff Bezos has gotten ahead of everyone else in terms of being able to get you things quickly, I'm often seeing just in the street packages that are left. And you can't do that in Miami. And I got to imagine that it's happening all the time in New York where packages are just left somewhere outside and an inordinate amount of packages have to be being stolen because Bezos has revolutionized how quickly you can get things and people have been addicted, have become addicted to the convenience of I don't have to go anywhere. I can just order something online and it'll get delivered. I'm not kidding you. The other day I was walking the, my dog at 530 in the morning and two different Amazon delivery men walked right past me to the hotel going past me sure. at 530 in the morning right. because they're working all the time. They're overworked. They're uh, you know, you've got conversations going on all over the place talking about the unionization of Amazon people, employees, because they have to, like, pee in their cars and stuff. And they're, you know, they're parking in the middle of the street because there's not parking anywhere. And I just think that the need for this has become so strong, the demand, that it's impossible, no matter how revolutionary Bezos is, to keep up with the supply without having, like, a bunch of extraneous extraneous spillage all over the place how much do you imagine in miami people are stealing because uh the the other day i had to go downstairs 
and get kitty litter that an Amazon driver, nobody's going to steal kitty litter, but had just left on Ocean Drive, had just left it outside because they couldn't get into the building because it was too too early in the morning. And I don't think that's that uncommon. So what do you imagine is the amount of thievery going on there or the budget that Amazon has for that kind of thievery? Uh, I would imagine there's a lot going on in terms of people stealing packages. I have no idea what their budget would be. I'm still looking up Walmart for you. But that's a staggering amount for Walmart. What do you I do? Mean, what do you do when you get something at your house that was sent to you that wasn't meant for you? That was meant for I keep someone it. else. <laughs> it happened to me this weekend. I looked at the address and I walked like four houses down and just put it in the driveway and walked away. I do that too. I'll I have one like there's like a north like I'm not gonna say my street, but there's like a north and south where it's the same exact address, just one little north or south difference. So me and this other house are always getting each other's stuff, and I just yeah. On my trip, drive it over there, drop it off. No, nothing. What's that person's address? I won't. I won't say it. Oh. <laughs> Not surprising at all that Stugatz would make no effort whatsoever to get that package. I don't believe him. Right I think he was doing a thing. I think you you deliver. Depends it. how far the walk is. You think you think Stugatz is going out of his way? I think he tells Abby. Like Abby, someone's got to bring this. Abby's telling me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the the amount of ring cameras that there are in the world now, we see we've seen these things become more prevalent because on only in date or on any of these websites or or IG. Oh, you'll get your ass kicked. Like you'll have the people's ring cam being like, "Oh, look, this guy just came and stole eight packages of yeah. mine." Does he he drives a blue Chevy Tahoe? Like, let's go get him. There have to be people wandering around just following Amazon trucks and looking for there. I, there has to be a crime syndicate of just stealing packages. <laughs> I love a syndicate. A thousand percent. <laughs> a thousand percent. <laughs> but they are relying on these cams outside of our front doors to, to protect that, I believe. Right. That has that to be their be argument. Good. It can't be good. Well, that the, just can't be good. The cams don't do anything. That you just see the guy walk away with your package. You're like, oh, I, I'm at work. I can't do oh, anything. Oh no! But there are all sorts of videos though of people getting their ass kicked and getting caught right in the middle of trying to steal that at the wrong house. You don't want to do that at the, at the wrong house. You can do it at Stugatz's house. There aren't going to be any consequences <laughs> other than him yelling at you, yelling at you from the other side of the door. I'm not running after you. It's kind of a crazy game, right? Like because. Most of the boxes are unmarked, so you're just stealing a box, not knowing That's what's correct. in there. That's so correct. it's like a secret Santa, except you're like the Grinch, like a yeah. secret Grinch almost. Like you're going just stealing random things, and then you surprise yourself with what you stole that day. <laughs> oh, it's Kleenex. Okay. The oh, no. sucks. Latex gloves. Uh, I wanted jewelry. I don't need this. Drapes. <laughs> Drapes. Drapes. I like the idea of the criminals getting upset at the people that order. Like, like really? You couldn't go to the store for this? He's broke. What do you need Twizzlers <laughs> for? Broke. Dan, I can't find the number that you're saying, but according to a quick Google search, Walmart claims that they lose $3 billion to theft every year, um, but they earn over $600 billion Hmm. per per year. Hmm. So, yeah. The idea of three billion dollars as minor inconvenience spillage. <laughs> just a spillage. lot of Kleenex. It seems like they just chalk it up. Like, yep, yeah, people are gonna steal. Yeah, like they're, they're not even worried about like it's preventing. Exactly it's what just, they I do. mean, I'm sure they yes. have prevention, but it's just like, yep, we're gonna lose three billion. That's Anytime it. that I've gotten one of my cards like stolen or they they ripped the number off on like a gas station or whatever, they always go to Walmart and buy a ton. Walmart and I'm yeah. just like does this happen to you a lot this, Often. it used to happen back in the day a lot more before the scanners and all that stuff but yeah I'm pretty sure that the reason that credit card interest rates are as high as they are is because they have to account for the amount of credit card fraud that there is I, I don't think that those numbers would be as high as they are and good lord there are a lot of people in our audience who have been swallowed by what a griff that credit card interest rate they're also thing preying is. on the poor too I yeah mean, if you're gonna be honest like, <laughs> that too. you know you're gonna put it on credit you're not gonna pay it back i can charge you a boatload of 25 percent exactly 29%. interest yeah. but i think a great deal of the reason that those numbers are so high is because they have to compensate for the number of people partaking in stugatzian fraud what? all over the place i mean what it's unfair stugatzbook.com everyone I feel like if we, if we went to Stugatz's house right now, we would find drapes that had been stolen from a neighbor's <laughs> I don't know any of it. I mean. <laughs> drapes. It's Hanging all next to the window. <laughs> what a random thing to order, boy. My neighbor would have such a nice house. <laughs> we need a new drapes.
what is the laziest thing you have ever ordered? Like, what is the thing that you have ordered for 45 cents that costs more in gas and delivery and boxes and environmental damage than it did because you just didn't want to be bothered to walk to a convenience store to do it? I don't, the, I've don't. i ordered specialized salt before. <laughs> wow. Celtic salt. Yeah, really good stuff. Himalaya? No, not Himalayan. Celtic. The difference. <laughs> Which way I had to get it. Stugatz and I were laughing during the break at the idea of Abby accidentally inviting a neighbor over and then the neighbor comes <laughs> over and then sees like seven things in the house. And, and Those are my drinks. <laughs> Stugatz, I, Stugatz just kept for himself. Really into the drapes, Roy. Yeah. What did the drapes the look like that you bought? They're white. Um, that's pretty much it. We need to beautify the white house. White drapes. That's a, Yeah. Mm. Uh, it is a funny visual yes. neighbor walking. Hey, yes, yes. yes you, I ordered that cast iron skillet. Yes. That's my lampshade. Abby offering up tea in what are clearly uh, is Stugatz in a Skims bodysuit. <laughs> Um, I saw over the weekend, and I wanted to ask you guys about this, because uh, when it comes to Drewski, for example, and I'm imagining Stugatz has no idea uh, who this is or what he does, but Drewski has gone mainstream. Not Brewski. In commercials and otherwise, he has gone mainstream after being internet famous first. And I told you this the other day when Shane Gillis hosted Saturday Night Live, he said to the Saturday Night Live audience, most of you probably don't know who I am because we are at an intersection culturally. And I don't think that the people listening to this necessarily realize what the numbers show Stugatz on just how much young people are consuming of the internet. It's a lot more than older people. There's an addiction, there is something happening with young people, there's a happiness problem as well because of how connected they are to the internet. But it became obvious to me when Shane Gillis is talking to the Saturday Night Live crowd, the audience, and he is saying, you don't know who I am. And then he is courtside at a Warriors game. And it's clear he doesn't expect Steph Curry to know who he is. And when Steph Curry sees him, you see the delight on Shane Gillis's face because like, oh, OK, this person knows me. And the thing that I wanted to ask uh, the group was when it comes to Internet famous versus mainstream famous we still have a huge disconnect between what those two things are when i watch the celebrity all-star game i don't know who any of those influencers are but who's right on the line because drewski's crossed over has he not he is not a person who's just internet famous right now but he is someone who got almost all of his fame through the merit of i'm going to be funnier than people on the internet, you've got a whole lot of content creators, Stugatz. This is, it's become a crazy proliferation because everyone has seen the amount of money that there is around being popular on YouTube. And there's just a revenue stream for people who aren't otherwise famous, but have a connection point with people that isn't accrued in what were the previous ways on how it is you got to influence and popularity. And I'm not just talking about influencers, though them too. I'm talking about content makers who are doing it not on the strength of being a beautiful person or not on the strength of some, you know, some sort of sex appeal, but on a talent where they're competing with other people to get famous because it's kind of the thing that everybody that's addicted to the internet seems to want. And when you look at guys like Drewski, guys like Kaisenak, guys like Jake Paul, guys like Aiden Ross, where they're YouTubers, they're content creators, but they kind of spill over. Like Jake Paul has gotten into boxing and obviously has turned that. He fought, by the way, over the weekend. I don't know if anybody knew that. <laughs> it was, I it did was not such know. a bad it's fighter. A, he was he fighting was a tomato fighting can. Yeah, God, sure. it was embarrassing. That a tomato fight. can? Yeah, he was fighting a tomato can. Did he can. fight one real boxer? He's like, all right, I'm good. Now I can go back to doing what I was doing. No, he yeah. fought a tomato can. Fought a tomato yeah. can. That's, that's the business. Uh, Dan's uh, you've MMA never heard of tomato never heard No, it. it's a great expression, yeah, though. A tomato can is a boxer who cannot actually So box. young, Jess. Just a, just Why a not guy. like a can of, like, pumpkin? 
Uh. <laughs> it's a good question. I uh. don't know why it, it, it can. Billy, can you look that up? Why is it a tomato like can? Peas. Why is some? Well, yeah, why soup. isn't it a can of uh, corn? Can of soup. I like you changing everything. Go ahead. I mean, a can of corn okay. is a pop up in baseball. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's why I didn't say corn. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why yeah. that's why not is a that a can, can of corn? I don't know why well, it's a can of corn. I don't know. We're going to look both up. of those yeah. things up. That's black beans, question. can of black beans. I don't know. I'm, to give not. to Dan in first class. Uh, people don't believe that that's so. They want photographic proof, but I'm telling you that they made the mistake on that flight from Las Vegas of serving black beans with rice in first class, and it's not a mistake any any professional airline should make. Presumably because of tendency to bleed when battered. Tomato juice leaking from a can being a metaphor for bleeding. Yeah, yeah that Very actually good. makes sense. It does. Yeah. How about can of corn? Why is a, why is a little pop-up to, uh, to second base called a can of corn? I'm still trying to find it here. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. Uh, when 19th century clerks at groceries and general stores were looking at, for an easier way to reach canned goods on high shelves, they started using long hooked sticks to pull them down. After dropping the cans towards them, they would catch them in their aprons, just like a fly ball. Huh. But why corn? Uh, that's just a can. This is on the top good. shelf. Yeah, it's a can. Good. Yeah. Can of corn. This yeah. keeps her peanut butter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Why her peanut butter? Look it up. Why not ask, jelly? Uh, I don't know. Ask him. Ask Randy. <laughs> Red Deer. <laughs> ask Randy's mom, actually. Tony, are you amazed uh, that when Billy throws stuff to you, it's never helpful? Like it's yeah, ne- but, it's, damn, but that's it's never wait, helpful. But that's okay because you know what we do? We remix it and we make it happen. We pull Miss Moller out of nowhere. And there you go, Billy. Come on, little. Like a tija.